Would you ask Lord Barwell to come back in, please? Thank you. Right, Lord Barwell, ready to carry on? Ready when you are. Good, thank you very much. Yes, Miss Grange, when you're ready. Yes, thank you. Yes, good afternoon, Lord Barwell. <clears throat> um, just some short follow-up questions on deregulation first, before we go back to that stuck-in private office email mm -hmm. chain. Um, in your evidence this morning, you explained that there'd been a change in emphasis on deregulation as between the Cameron and the May governments, yes? That's my perspective, yes. And you weren't sure whether one in, one out was in effect under the, the May government, is well, that fair? I think it was one in, three out you were, you were putting to me, yeah. Yes. Now, let's have a look at the uh, Conservative Party manifesto for 2017. This is at IDX 0922. Here we have it. It's the Conservative and Unionist Party manifesto 2017. And then if we go within this document uh, to uh, page 17... Just wait for the document to come up or the, the page to come up. Seems to be a problem. Ah, here we go. So here we have page 17 within that manifesto. And if you look at the bottom of that page, can you see the heading effective regulation? Yep. And it says in that first paragraph, regulation is necessary for the proper ordering of any economy and to ensure that people and their investments are protected. However, poor and excessive government regulation limits growth for no good reason. So we will continue to regulate more efficiently, saving £9 billion through the red tape challenge and the one in, two out rule. Do you see that? I do. So it certainly does appear that one in, two out was part of that manifesto pledge and presumably that was also... Uh, part of, of of your operating. It, it know, certainly annual. sounds like that. It's, it's, I mean, I I didn't know the detail of the manifesto outside of the housing area, but it sounds to me like the one in three out policy was ditched, but the one in two out one was continued. From what you've just presented. Yes. So we can see a clear manifesto commitment to continuing those deregulatory policies. Well, ste stepping back from the one in three out, but continuing one in two out. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, now, even if you felt there was a change in emphasis <coughs> personally, given this commitment, how were officials in your department supposed to have divined that there had been a change of emphasis other than what you've already explained in the housing white paper? Yeah, I think, I think you can see a change of emphasis in the documents that I referred to, but clearly the, the policy for deregulation from what you've just showed me continued, albeit in a slightly altered form. Yes. <laughs> Now, going back to the topic we were on before we broke off, which was about research reports getting stuck. Yep. Um, so just to go back over the history, what we can see is in December 2015, a submission is put up to James Wharton to clear those seven work streams reports. And then there are a series of chases. Now, many of those chases are before your time, but there are a number of chases that occur after you've come into office, including in August, October, November, December 2016, and January and March 2017. Now, as far as we can uh, work out from the documents. If we go back to Mr. Ledsom's email we were looking at, CLG 3019376. Um, if you look within this email on the 13th of October 2016 to PS, we assume that's Private Secretary Gavin Barwell. Yes. So that's, a, that's an email address that all three of my private secretaries would have been able to access to clarify. Yes, and it looks like it was Ed Neve that he was... It's addressed it to. Addressed yes. it to, and that he was an assistant private secretary, yes. Yeah, he in was your, the number two private secretary, yes. In your office? Yes. Yes. And I did read this paragraph out to you, but I just want to go back to it. Underneath the bullet points on this screen we see an explanation of the background to this. And it, say, it says, these are all reports dating back to projects commissioned under the coalition government in line with a commitment in a <clears throat> PQ of summer 2015 to publish them all by the end of the year. The original submission and reports went up last December. So that was last December 2015 to James Wharton. 
And then it says this, eventually we had agreement from previous SPADs that they could be published immediately after the referendum. So now, just to be clear, we don't have the correspondence we've checked from those previous SPADs. That wasn't part of the disclosure that we requested. Um, but so what we've got to go on is what Mr. Ledsim is saying in this email. And if he's right, what he's saying is the previous SPADs to James Wharton had agreed these reports and that they could be published immediately after the referendum. Then what we see in this series of emails, October 2016, is your assistant private secretary corresponding with Mr. Ledsom about matters stuck in private office. Now, um, just help us with this. If they've been cleared by the previous SPADs, would additional SPADs, SPADs to the, the Secretary of State, Sajid Javid, now also need to clear these? I suspect so. Right. I don't know, because I don't know exactly how the SPADs would have worked, but I think given that it was effectively a new government, officials would probably have felt that they needed to get approval from new ministers and new SPADs, and they couldn't take a previous decision uh, as binding in terms right. of publication. Yes. I'm just, that's my educated okay. guesswork, to be clear. Because the emails don't say they're stuck with the new SPADs. They seem to be emails suggesting they're stuck in your private office. That's how we'd read this. So... Um, well, look, there are a number of things I wanted to say about this. Yeah. The first and the most important thing is, I just want to repeat what I said earlier, this is appalling that these docu that these that it took so long for this research work. Well, whoever's to blame, whatever the mistake was, it's totally unacceptable that public money was spent on this research and it took this long to publish it. Now, I, I am sceptical that they were stuck in my office and I want to give you the two reasons why, but I can't prove it to you. And it, in a way, it almost doesn't matter where there was a fault and these yeah. things should have been published. But if you could go on to the top of the next page, there's an exchange, and it's, the, it's not the bottom email from Ed I want, but it's the one further up the column. Yes. So there was an email from Ed at the Hang bottom. On, slow, slow down a second. Sorry, yeah. Because, again, I think we've got to try and help the yes. transcriber out. Apologies. OK, let's first go to page two. OK, so you can see... At the, at the, <laughs> if we scroll up a bit there, so... No, that's it, that's it, yes. So there's an email that is the 13th of October, yes. 1552, where Ed is saying to Bob, thanks, Bob, would you mind just letting us know which ones are with SPADs in the meantime? Which is clearly implying that at least some of the submissions, and the submissions that Ed is talking about, to be clear, are not just building regulation submissions. He's trying to do an overall exercise to see what's stuck in private office. Yes. But he's saying... He's clearly implying here that some of these things are stuck with SPADs, not uh, right. in my office or other ministers' offices. Yes. The second reason I would give to you for saying that I don't believe these were stuck in my office, and I just want to maybe add a bit more detail, Chairman, to what I had to say this morning, is to describe to you the way my office worked. So I've already intimated to you that the volume of paperwork that was coming in was, was very significant. And a combination of me, myself, Claire Brunton, who was my principal private secretary, and certain senior officials operated a sort of almost constant triage system to try and escalate the submissions that were the most important. And I would say of all of the officials concerned, Steve Quartermain played an absolutely crucial role in that because a significant proportion of the submissions fell within his area because they were planning case work submissions. So I would say it would be a regular occurrence maybe once a week or once a fortnight, that Steve and I would discuss what I had outstanding that, in his opinion, was urgent and needed a decision. And I would then prioritise those to the top of my entry and make sure that I got them dealt with. Yes. So I can't prove it to you, but all I can say to you is I find the idea that Steve... if these, This is clearly so wrong that they have been waiting that long that the idea that Steve would not have come to me and said, Gavin, you've been, these are not just you've been sitting them for ages, but they've been waiting for ages before you were ever appointed, please get them dealt with. So I can't really add any more to you than that. I just, I don't believe these ones were stuck in my office. I'm perfectly happy to say on the record that there were other research reports that took me a while to clear, but they all did get cleared. Whether they were stuck with SPADs or stuck in your it's office... equally bad. It, it, it's unacceptable, yeah. isn't it? It's equally bad, but you did yeah. put to me that you thought it was likely to be in my but office. That was just, our reading, because yeah, it was Ed Neve. I just want to 
say to you why I don't believe that was the case, but I'm, I, I did say, and I'm happy to repeat for you, wherever the fault lay, it's completely unacceptable. It's right. appalling that it took that long. And just help us with this. Which spads would they have been stuck with? The Secretary of State's spads? Yeah, they are the only spads. Right, I see. So they're, they're, uh, I think I'm right in saying the way uh, that the, the special advisors sat in one office and there was a civil servant private secretary for the SPAD team collectively. So there was, there was an official whose job was to filter the papers in and out of the special right. advisor's office. So is it that official that should have been contacted if they were stuck with the SPADs and said, you yeah, know, for goodness sake, this has been going on for too long now. We've been chasing. Get these SPADs to look at this. Is that what should yes. have happened? So, so I suspect what Ed is trying to get here is which of the subs that are not on my minister's desk but are elsewhere let me know about them so I can then go and have that conversation right. and to give you to, to my, I don't want to sound too defensive but to give you an illustration of the situation I think if you look at the email chain for the approval of the September 2016 iteration of the discussion document you will see that that waited in SPAD's office for over a month after I had signed it off yes and I didn't know that yes one of the things when I get the document bundle for this inquiry I was amazed that I, after I, the minister, had approved something, officials had to wait a further month because, yes. Yes. because of that. So it definitely was possible. I can't yeah. put it any stronger. Now, just to complete this story a little bit, if we look at the submission you were sent on the 23rd of March 2017 at CLG 3019392. Now, we'll come back to this. This is the submission with the final version of the discussion document. Yes. You're also being asked at this point, see item four under recommendations here, that you clear the completed research projects for publication which support the scope of work set out in the discussion document and which we need to discuss with industry. Yes. Do you see that? I do. And in Annex C, if we go to page 10, we get a list of those uh, discussion reports right at the bottom of page 10. That's the seven work streams, fire compartment sizes and investigation of real fires. Do you see that? I do. So you are being sent this in March 2017 after quite a lot of chasing for either SPAD approval or your office approval. Um, and, and, and so we can see the delay that's been caused here. Do you yes, see that? I do see that. And I approve this. But I presume what you're now going to tell me is that because the election was called, my approval didn't count and they had to go right back round the circle again with the next minister. Well, that appears to be the case. Can you shed any light on that? that that's only my educated guesswork. But there is in the document pile... There is an email, again, I don't have all my papers in front of me, obviously, but there is an email from my private secretary, Kieran, giving my feedback on this submission. We've seen that, and I'll Saying that, that I accept, I approve the recommendations. I think it says I had a particular interest and wish to be kept updated on the ones on part B and part M in terms of the, the first recommendation about the discussion document. But I, I approve this sub. I think it's the 18th of... I'm, relying on memory, well, but I think it's the 18th of yeah, April. When I'll I'm... take you back to that, um, and we'll look at that. <coughs> Mr Martin told us in his evidence, uh, it's in his uh, witness statement, that without the publication of the seven work, work streams report, enabling the industry to consider them, we were not able to progress the discussion document needed to inform a full technical review. And that was initially Mr Harrell's evidence as well, although in his oral evidence he accepted that the discussion document could have been taken forward without publication of the the reports. Now, were you ever told that they were being held up with getting on with a discussion document because these seven work streams reports had not been approved? So, so no, and I wasn't aware that the work stream reports hadn't been approved. Could you could you go forward? You showed me first of all the covering page of this submission with the two recommendations. Could you take me back to that screen? Do you think? Yes, page one. Yes, first page. You showed me. Yeah. There's the, fir the first page. So, I mean, I would just make two points to you about paragraph four, the, the recommendation that you drew my attention to. Yes. First of all, it doesn't say that that's necessary in order to publish the discussion document. It says it supports the work in the discussion document. Yes. And secondly, it certainly doesn't make any reference that these have been outstanding for a long time or, or are urgent, right. which clearly they were. I'm not disputing that for a second, but it doesn't, it's interesting that it doesn't make that point. Right. But no, the answer to your question is no, I wasn't 
I wasn't told that, although I did approve the submission. Right. Now, in the next part of my question, I'm going to be looking in more detail at that discussion paper and what you knew about it and the evolution of it. Were you aware that the discussion document was originally due to be published at the end of 2015, then that was pushed forward to early 2016, and then publication was expected in the autumn of 2016? Did anyone ever tell you that? Uh, no, apart from the last bit of what you've said. So I, I know it now because I've heard Minister Walton's evidence, and, and, but I obviously did know from the evidence I gave before lunch that it was originally due for publication in the autumn of 2016 because the September version of this submission used the phrase publication after conference. No. So I, I knew that. I didn't know that it had been delayed several times before, before my that. arrival, if that's helpful. Yes, that's helpful. Now, um, I want to turn to a letter that you received in August 2016, just in this context. It, it's at HOM 30333377. Now, this is quite a long letter, so I can't, we don't have time to go through it all. It's from the British Sprinkler Alliance, sorry, the Business Sprinkler Alliance, and it's sent to you in August 2016. So very shortly after your uh, appointment. And um, I just want to focus uh, on the final paragraph on page one that runs into page two. So they say here, we understand that one of your first tasks will be to consider the status of the fire safety provisions of the building regulations which are detailed in approved document B. This document was last reviewed 10 years ago. A new review is therefore long overdue and your predecessor has indicated in written responses to parliamentary questions that a review is under consideration. He also indicated that one approach to the review may be to simplify the ADB guidance document to reduce red tape for business. The BSA agrees that the document needs to be simplified to make it more user friendly. We also in principle welcome an objective to reduce red tape. However, the review does also need to be thorough because building materials and construction techniques have changed significantly over the last 10 years and use patterns of industrial and commercial buildings have evolved. These changes need to be reflected in ADB. For example, and a number of bullet points then appear, and in the first one it says, there has been an increase in the use of insulation systems to achieve ever better energy efficiency ratings. In the event of a fire, these systems can impact combustibility and the spread of the fire and can increase fire temperatures. This needs to be considered in the overall design of the building, notably the fire resistance of the structure as well as the surrounding materials. And then the letter ends on page four with an offer to meet in the very last paragraph. The BSA would be uh, pleased to help you realise this outcome and would appreciate an opportunity to meet to do so. Now, um, do you remember this letter? I don't. Now, it we're coming wasn't to... in the in the pack of documents that was released to me, so I haven't seen it before today. OK. We're coming to some emails in a moment that suggest that you, you may well have seen it. Um, now, it tells you what we know that you were already told in the briefing document in October 2016, that uh, approved document B had not <coughs> been formally reviewed since 2016, yes? Sorry, 2006, yes? Yes. Now, did you know, were you ever told, that the department had moved away from there being a regular cycle uh, of periodic review of the approved documents at particular time intervals? Did you, were you ever told that? I'm thinking because I, th I think what I was told was that the department wanted to move to having a regular cycle, which certainly would acknowledge that there wasn't a regular cycle at that point in time. I don't think I was ever told that there used to be a regular cycle. Is that, is that clear? Yes, it is. Yeah. Now, presumably, if you can't recall whether you uh, saw this document or can't recall reading it, um, you can't help us as to whether you asked any of your officials to take any of the concerns in this letter into account but when working on ADB? No, I can't. I mean, did I reply to this letter? Sorry, well, let's look because at it's email. not in my bundle, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with it. And obviously, the number of letters that you saw as a minister, it's very hard to remember one letter from, from six years ago. Of course. L let's try and help. If we go to CLG 1308434...
and we look at the top email in the chain, it's, um, it appears to be from the office of Gavin Barwell, sent on the 15th of August 2016 to Gavin Barwell. Do you see that? Yes. So I think I can now explain what's happened here. Review. Well, hang on a minute. Let's just look at it first. Subject, review of approved document B. Attachments, business sprinkler alliance letter on the review of approved document B of the building regulations, PDF. And then it says, hi, please see attached letter to be assigned to Bob Bledsoe as an MSU, please. This has been sent for advice as an invitation. Officials advised to decline and Gavin agrees that he would not like to meet. Please therefore arrange for a line to be included to refuse their invitation to meet at the present time. Do you see that? I do. Now, what is an MSU? Uh, I don't know, but I suspect it's an official reply to the letter rather than the minister applying, would be my guess. Yes. Can we agree that it would appear from this email that you did see this letter? No. I think probably not from what you've just showed me. Because? So Letitia was my diary secretary. Uh, so there's obviously a very large number of invitations that come into a minister to meet. And what she would do is she would print off these invitations, bundle them together, and she would get advice from officials about whether they thought I should accept the meeting or not. And she would just come to me and say, what do you think? So I probably haven't read the whole letter. I suspect what happened is that she said to me, this is from the Business Sprinklers Alliance. Officials advise a meeting not appropriate. Do you want to overrule? And I would have said no. I probably haven't read the whole letter. And the fact that it says to be assigned to Bob Ledsom as an MSU means that officials are saying that a civil servant should reply to the letter, not a minister. If I were replying to the letter, I would have read the letter. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead here, but when there's ministerial correspondence, you generally don't see the letter until someone's drafted the reply. Mm. And my practice would, would have been to read the letter at that point before then deciding if I was happy with the reply that officials had drafted. So the way this is worded, my assumption would be I didn't read the letter. I was simply asked whether I wanted to meet them and the officials' advice was that I didn't need to at this stage. Right. But you were a new housing minister with no background in fire safety matters. Wouldn't it have actually been quite useful to meet with organisations like this? I, I can assure you I could have filled my time five, six-fold with, with meetings that would have been useful. Uh, so you have to prioritise uh, who you're going to meet with. I, there were definitely occasions when officials would advise I shouldn't meet with someone and I overruled it. Um, but I didn't do so on, on this occasion. So right. you certainly shouldn't take that as an indication that the meeting would have been of no use. I'm sure it would have been useful. But you asked me a question about whether I read the letter. And I think given the evidence that you've now shown me, which I hadn't seen before, I think that is suggesting that I would not have seen the letter. I see. I mean, had you actually seen the letter and, and been told that ADB was last reviewed 10 years ago, there have been significant changes in techniques since that time, and this use of insulation to give better energy efficiency ratings, which impact on combustibility, um, would that have changed your mind in terms of whether you'd have met these people? So I'd, I'd like to say yes because obviously I'm answering the question now knowing what I know about what happened subsequently. But if I'm being honest with you, I can't guarantee that if I'd read the whole letter, I would have said yes because of the huge pressures on time when you were a minister initially. What I might have said is, once we've got through the initial run of, of the urgent stuff that I've got to do straight away, could we put something in the diary down the line? Yes, I see. So when it says there, Gavin agrees... All you've done is accept the advice... Not to meet on this occasion. Not which, to meet. And, you know, as I said... Sorry, sorry, let me finish. Apologies. Not to meet, but not having read the letter, so not knowing what the concerns were that were being raised with you. I, yeah. would, have, I would not have read the entire letter. I would have seen who the organisation were and, and made a decision based on that. Uh, and without in any way um, diminishing the importance of the Business Sprinkler Alliance... I would, have, I would have had, as I said, five or six times more invitations to things than it was feasibly possible to take up, and so you had to prioritise. Right. Now, if we look at uh, the first submission you got specifically about the discussion document and ADB, this is at CLG 3019368. This is a submission from Richard Harrell <coughs> to you and Sajid Javid. Do you see that? I do. And we 
you tell us at paragraph 16 of your uh, first witness statement on page 7 that you were sent this submission on the 15th of September 2016. So that, that should help you. And we can see from the first paragraph that this submission seeks agreement to progress publication of a discussion document setting out the potential scope of future work to simplify building regulations and strengthen the building control system. Yes? Yes. And then on page one, we see the recommendations below that, that you agree that officials should continue to develop the building regulations discussion document with a view to publication in the autumn. So that would be the autumn of 2016, yes? Yes, and I think if you look at paragraph two, it's a little bit more explicit that it's after party conference, which would take place in early October. Right. And you can, we can see at paragraph four, the recommendation is you agree that it's circulated at official level to other government departments for discussion prior to formal write around. And then five, that you agree officials can start engagement with BRAC, the Building Regulations Advisory Committee, to establish relevant working groups so that we can progress engagement with industry immediately after the discussion document is published. And then if we could look at paragraph six on page two... It says, previous ministers agreed that officials should work with BRAC, the Statutory Industry Committee, charged with advising ministers on building regulations matters, to develop proposals for a discussion document setting out the broad scope of review and reform of the building regulations and building control system over this parliament. Um, and again, so did you read this parliament to mean your current parliament yes. rather than anything earlier? yes. And then um, if we go to page four, there's a list of annexes at the bottom of the page, and Annex A was a draft discussion document. So you were actually sent a draft of that document. Yes, although I haven't seen that in the document pack that I had. I've just had the submission. That's fine. Um, do you remember actually reading the draft discussion document when you received this submission in September 2016? Uh, I don't remember reading it, but I'm absolutely sure I will have done. Right. Um, if we just pull it up, it's at CLG 30019367. There we have it. That's the draft you were sent. And the Part B section begins at the bottom of page 25. There we go, Part B, fire safety. And you can take it from me. I don't think we need to go through it. But the headings below that include two different types of property protection, Specialised housing, smoke alarms, basements, means of escape for the disabled and links with the fire safety order. Those were the topics. Now, did you notice at the time that there was nothing in that document about increased use of combustible insulation materials on the exterior of buildings due to the drive in energy efficiency? Uh, I, I can't remember, but I can't see why that would have been something particularly memorable to me because I wasn't aware of that issue. Well, had you read the British Sprinkler Association letter, you would have been aware of that issue, but I think your evidence now is that you're unlikely to have read that in detail. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, and with respect, even if I'd read the British Sprinkler letter, given the numbers of pieces of correspondence you were reading, I'm not sure if it's necessarily the case. I would have remembered that a month or so later. Yes. Now, thinking back to the submission, you can take it from me that the submission does not mention the Lacanal House inquest, the Rule 43 letter, or the commitment made by Eric Pickles. Yes, I think I made that point my, myself this morning, yeah. And the submission does not give any sense of urgency about these steps. No, uh, to the contrary, I think, from memory, there was something in there about the timescale which suggested this was, you just quoted it to me, that it was a programme of work during the rest of this parliament, so by definition, yes. it wasn't urgent, it was a medium to long-term programme of work. Yes. Did you inquire at this point about how long this work had been in progress? Uh, no, I didn't, no. Help us with this. Why were officials asking you if they could continue to develop a discussion document? Cutting to the chase, didn't you want to see a final version of the discussion document and then agree it for publication? What is the point of this submission, just to ask you if they can continue developing it? I suspect the main point, uh, if we could maybe go back to the... Yes, let's go back to the submission. So, CLG 30019368. I suspect it's probably uh, the latter two recommendations, the, the crucial ones here. I have much the same reaction as you to the first recommendation, which is you don't really need our permission to continue working on something, uh, that the real moment at which ministers 
would be interested in is in signing off the document. Uh, I guess they might have thought that it was a chance to offer up any particular comments, but probably the two key recommendations here is that officials felt that they needed permission to engage with officials outside of our department and also permission to engage externally beyond the government with the Building Regulations Advisory Committee. Right, I see. Why, but that's why? just educated guesswork on my part. Yeah, I see. Well, I'm not going to pursue that anymore. Um, so uh, if we now look at a document that follows this, CLG 1308624... CLG 1308624. We're just waiting for that document to come up. Okay. Yes. So here we <coughs> have... Um, and and we fo if we focus on this top email in the chain, mm -hmm. an email chain um, from your office, office of Gavin Barwell, to Richard Harrell on the se September the 29th, 2016, sent at 3.47, and we can see a number of other advisors and officers are copied in. And the subject is submission, GB building regulations discussion document... Uh, and it says, hi, Richard and all, thank you for your submission. Gavin has seen it and agrees with the recommendations to continue development of the building regulations discussion document and to circulate at official level for discussion prior to formal right round for publishing. He agrees that officials can begin engagement with BRAC to establish relevant working groups. Gavin has asked you to consider Tim Lunick's comments attached in moving forward with the review. Do you see that? I do. And you tell us at paragraph 21 of your second statement at page 9 that you understood that the review would be carried out officials, including Richard Harrell and Bob Ledsom, with appropriate external engagement from BRAC, yes? Yes, that was my understanding. And you don't mention Brian Martin there. Did you have any understanding at this point about what his role would be in the process? I, I recognise... Brian's name, so I suspect he was in some of the meetings with me, but the two officials where I can sort of definitively say that I engage with regularly would have been Brian Ledsom and, and Richard Harrell. Yes. So I, I Bob, can't, uh, I can't, sorry, Bob Ledsom and, and Richard Harrell, I can't definitively say to you about Brian. Yes. Now, can we agree that setting up the Part B working party could have happened concurrently with work on the discussion document? Do you agree with that? Uh, well, it, it depends what you wanted that Part B working party to do. So if, if what you're saying is the, the simplification point that we were touching on earlier, that definitely could have been done as a separate work stream from this wider piece of work. I think it's, a, it's at least, I'm not a specialist, but I think it's at least theoretically possible that you could have reviewed approved document B separately from the rest of the building regulations work if that's what you're asking me. Yes. Do you know why efforts to establish the working groups didn't start in September 2016 once you'd confirmed that you'd agreed with that engagement? Were you ever given a reason why that didn't happen? When you say to, to establish the working groups, what do you mean, sorry? Yes, well, the, the BRAC oh, to start, relevant To start the discussions groups. with BRAC. Yeah, look, it says, um, yeah. third line down, engagement with BRAC to establish relevant working groups. So uh, I don't know. I, it, it is possible that that work was put on hold when we delayed the discussion document until after the white paper, but I can't definitively tell you what the reason was. By the date of the Grenfell Tower fire, four years after Lord Pickles' commitment, a formal working group to look at Part B fire safety issues had still not been established. Were you aware of that uh, when, you, when you left office? Um, I'd have to look again at the, the March submission. I think it, it does hint that some work had started, but whether that was work with BRAC or whether that was just work internally in the department, I don't know. You can't help us with that? I'm not, I, without looking at the document, I couldn't... Yeah. My memory's not good enough to tell you. I know that it referenced we have already started work on this, but I can't remember whether that was work externally with BRAC or just work internally within the department. Yeah. 
Now, I want to look now at a letter from the APPG, the All-Party Parliamentary Fire Safety and Rescue Group, which is dated the 12th of September 2016, and which was then resent on the 17th of October 2016. Now, before we look at this letter itself, I, I just want to briefly look at paragraph 27, page 11, of your first witness statement. You tell us this, you say... On the 12th of September 2016, David Amos sent a letter to me referring to James Wharton's promise to make an announcement about the review of approved document B. This letter never arrived at the department and was resent on the 17th of October 2016. I was aware from this letter that the APPG had been in correspondence with my predecessor, which would not have been uncommon, but I was not aware that the chain of correspondence between ministers and the APPG had been going on for what I now understand to be a period of years. So that's what you tell us in your statement. Did you ever discuss the APPG correspondence directly with Bob Ledsom, Richard Harrell or Brian Martin? I'm not sure if I did directly. I, I amended one of the reply letters, which we'll come on to, I'm sure, as we run through the APPG correspondence. But whether the conversation was between my private office and the building works team or whether they came into the office and I discussed it directly, I don't know. Yes. I will take you to the letter. I think it's you April know, 2017. Yeah, that's right that you said you amended because you didn't like the tone of the... the well, it was more than that. I was... I mean, I'm, we're jumping ahead in the story, but I had delayed the meeting. I, did, I responded to this first letter, turning down an initial meeting. The delay turned out to be longer than expected because the white paper took longer than expected. Then another letter went missing. So by the time I finally get, I think it's the February letter, to my desk in early April, I was mortified at how long the delay had been. So I completely rewrote the letter, giving David the direct number of my private office so that we could meet as quickly as possible. But I don't know whether my private office would just have informed the building regs team that that's what we were going to do or whether they came up for a meeting. I can't, I'm afraid, recall that, but um, I don't know. Did you ever get a sense of what your official's attitude was towards the APPG and its correspondence? No, other, other than implicitly from the fact that the advice on the initial letter and the second letter was to turn it down, which implicitly suggests that officials didn't think it was a priority for a meeting, but no one ever said anything in a submission or in a meeting with me, which, uh, if you like, was pejorative and gave a, gave a view of the APPG. And what did you understand the APPG's main concerns to be? So it's a difficult question to answer now because obviously I've read the entire back chain of correspondence so I know what the concerns are uh, now, which I, at the time, uh, I hadn't. Um, but it, I don't know if you can call up the first letter. That I'm about to go to it. Let's go to it. It's at CLG 3019398. And it starts uh, on page... Uh, well, you can see here the letters being resent, as I explained earlier, on the 17th of October yes. 2016. Uh, Sir David sent you the enclosed letter on the 12th of September, but we do not seem to have received a response. And then if you go over the page, you can see the September letter. That's <coughs> lovely. Thank you. Yeah, so I think that the key... Well, hey, sorry. sorry. I, I thought I was still I'm going to ask, ask you your the question. Go on. And then, <laughs> and then you'll answer. Um, in the second paragraph... Uh, I, I want to pick it up. It, it, they say, the previous post holder with the building regulations responsibility was James Wharton MP, who met with the group as long ago as no 26th of November 2015, when he promised to make an announcement shortly about the review of approved document B, guidance fire safety to the regulations, where a great deal of preparatory work had already been done, but with some serious outstanding issues still needing to be addressed. Regrettably, we have yet to receive any announcement on this, which is of such importance to the fire and construction sectors. And then it goes on. I recall that you did speak at a parliamentary fire seminar in Westminster following the riots in Croydon in 2013. So you already have an understanding of the need for effective fire safety in the built environment with increased use of modern materials in methods and, and methods of construction. And then over the page... 
the group comprising a few of its members would very much appreciate an early informal meeting with you, possibly over lunch when Parliament returns in October following recess, to discuss some of the issues which remain a cause for concern to the group. There will be no minutes taken, but just general exchange of thoughts as to where we both see the current issues and what priorities there are for the built environment. I look forward to receiving a positive response to this invitation to meet with a few members of the group at your earliest convenience. Meanwhile, I'm attaching a copy of my last letter to James, dated the 20th of June 2016, with enclosures also attached, to which I have yet to receive a response or acknowledgement, exclamation mark. It would be helpful if you were able to clarify the position in order that I can also write again to the Secretary of the Balmoral Residents Association in relation to a tower block fire in Westcliff-on-Sea, Essex, in which a pregnant woman died and seven people were reportedly taken to hospital. To date, I've only acknowledged the letter and referred it to James, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Many thanks in anticipation of your kind assistance with this. So that's the letter. Now, prior to receiving this letter, were you made aware that an announcement on the review of ADB had been promised for short, shortly after the meeting with James Wharton in November 2015? No. Were you concerned about the apparent delay when you read this letter? I, I can't remember exactly what my sense was uh, when I saw it, but I obviously knew David uh, very, very well. Um, I accepted the advice not to offer a meeting at this point because at the point at which we're looking at this, we were still expecting, I think, to publish the discussion document shortly and it seemed more sensible to have the meeting once that document was in the public domain and then the meeting would be more uh, productive. What was your understanding about the serious outstanding issues which the APPG considered still needed to be addressed back in 2015? Did you have any understanding of what those were? No, other than if we could, if we could maybe go back to the, to the first page of the letter. Yes. There is a reference there to modern... Oh, sorry, no. Sorry, it's, page, it's on page, page two. two. There is a letter there. There's a reference there to the increased use of modern materials and methods of construction. So it's not clear... If that, if that latter point in the third paragraph are the serious outstanding issues that David's referring to, it's not entirely clear, but no. it, that, I, would have, I would have flagged that as a possible thing. Did you ask any of your officials within the department to explain to you when you received this letter what the main concerns had been that had been raised by this group previously? No, because at this point my expectation was that I was going to meet them fairly shortly and I would be able to have that conversation directly with them. In mentioning the Tower Block fire in Essex, in which the pregnant woman died and seven people were reportedly taken to hospital, did you appreciate that this review was something which was becoming urgent? So I took, and I still take, the reference to the Tower Block slightly differently to the construction that you've just put on it. So the way I read this letter is that the three paragraphs you see there, and then if we could go on to the last page again... Um, are in relation to the APPG's concerns. And then I assumed the last couple of paragraphs are a constituency issue where David is asking for a reply in order that he can go back to his constituent. So I, maybe I'm wrong, but I didn't take that reference to that particular fire as being core to the APPG's concerns. It was another issue that David had asked for a response for James on Right. so that he could go but I presume David was an Essex MP I presume West Clifton C is in his constituency and he was looking to reply to a constituent when you first saw this correspondence with the APPG did you ask to see at least some of the historic correspondence with the group so that you could see the context because it's plain isn't it from what they've said in this letter including the penultimate main paragraph that there's a history here they're frustrated they're frustrated that promises have been made and have been broken and and they're getting <clears throat> agitated about that didn't that call for you to at least be aware of what the previous correspondence showed well as i said at this point i was anticipating meeting them fairly soon and therefore that i could discuss that with them in person in hindsight your point is very well made and now having read the previous correspondence one of the things that struck me when i saw it is that the warnings to James in some of the early letters are much more punchy, if I can put it that way, much more stark is probably a better word, than, than the warning in this page on the first letter. 
uh, on, on the first page of this letter. Yeah. So with hindsight, clearly it would have been better had I done that. I would have had a much quicker appreciation of the magnitude of their concerns. But at the moment in time when I accepted the advice not to have the meeting straight away, my assumption was that meeting was going to come fairly soon and that I could discuss that with them in person. Yes. Uh, can we agree that officials really ought to have at least gisted for you that previous correspondence so you had some idea of the substance of their concerns and the gravity of what they'd raised previously? Can we agree that that ought to have happened? If, if so, I want to I, don't, I want to be clear here. It's possible that that back correspondence was behind the pile, and I didn't look at it. I don't think it was. That didn't normally happen, but it is possible. But if that if that wasn't the case, it would have been useful to have that context. Absolutely. Yes, because <clears throat> what appears to happen is every time we get a new minister, there's no corporate memory being carried over. So each minister kind of starts again and doesn't appreciate that there's a whole history of of actually pretty concerning correspondence with this group. C can you explain how officials are effectively, uh, one reading of it is they're, they're kind of playing ministers by deliberately making sure they're not aware of the background. And, and so you start again and the cycle begins again. What's your response I, I, to that? I'm not sure why officials would want to do that unless you're suggesting that the officials thought that the concerns that were being raised were groundless and it was all a waste of ministers' time. I do think your point about lack of handover is very well made. Um, I said in my evidence this morning that Brandon and I arranged that between ourselves and I should have done it with James as well. But I do think more generally it would be very good practice for ministers to have a proper handover with whoever has done uh, their job uh, <coughs> for them. I mean, obviously, very tragically, David is no longer with us. But one of the things that I think is, is probably worth saying, just to help the chair and, and the panel in appreciating this APPG correspondence, which I think is a very important kind of a warning that was missed in this process. There were clearly problems with the, way, with, with the department system for handling correspondence. I think the APG writes, PPG writes to me a total of seven times and I only ever see three of those letters. Yeah. So four of them just go missing. Um, so there's a, there's a sort of issue there. In my experience, many MPs knew that government correspondence took time at best and could sometimes just disappear. So if it's useful context to you, it was quite common that an MP would approach me in the division lobbies when we were voting in the evening and say to me, I've written this letter to your department just in case it gets lost or buried in the official system. I want to give you a paper copy. I'm really worried about this. I want you to personally see it. Um, one, of, one of the strange things about this is that David didn't speak to me. And indeed, without jumping ahead, even when I gave him the phone number of my private office, he didn't phone the private office to ask for a meeting. He wrote another letter. It's a sort of quite old school traditional way of uh, doing business. But I, 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 it's, a long, it's a long answer to your question, which I hope provides some useful context. But I think in summary, what I would say, your point is very well made about handover. I, I don't understand what the incentive on the officials would be to sort of game this correspondence unless, unless you believed that they thought the whole thing was exaggerated and not a good use of minister's time. Yes. Well, I mean, separate views can be taken about that. Um, now, we see from the documents that it was Brian Martin that drafted a response for you to this letter. And that response is at CLG 3019399. It's dated here, we can see, the 14th of November 2016. You can see that from the date stamp at the top. And it's from you to Sir David Amos. And he, you say, dear David, thank you for your letter of the 17th of October on behalf of the all-party parliamentary fire safety and rescue group. I'm sorry that your original letter of 12th September does not appear to have arrived in this office. With respect to your concerns relating to the fire safety aspects of building regulations, my department has been looking at a range of issues relating to the regulations, many of which are interrelated, and our intention is to make a statement in due course. 
in your original letter, you kindly offered to meet over lunch to discuss the issues that you have raised. I know that you had a similar meeting with my predecessor and the views of your group are being given proper consideration. As such, I think it would be better and more constructive to wait until after this statement has been made so that our conversation can be in context. And he says, your original letter also seeks a response to your letter of 20th of June to James Wharton. I assume you received a response, but if you haven't, then please resend it. And I'll endeavour to respond in good time. Now, going back to the second paragraph, um, what was the statement which you were anticipating making at this time? Uh, this, I think, refers to the publication of the discussion document. I see. We would have made, we would obviously have to make a statement to Parliament at that point, either a written statement or possibly an oral statement setting out what the department was doing. And at this point, so this is the 14th of November 2016, when did you anticipate that such a statement would be made? So I can't give you an exact date, but at this point we were hoping for publication of the white paper, uh, I guess sort of late November, and then we would move on to the discussion document from that, so it was probably either just before Christmas or early in the new year. Right. Why not give uh, some kind of time frame? So the APPG would know how long they would have to wait for another meeting with a minister? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I suppose it, officials may have been wary of doing that given that the timetable had just shifted uh, and experience may have taught them that my and the Secretary of State's optimism about how quickly we could get the white paper cleared was misplaced. I don't know. Right. What were the views, looking at the third paragraph and the third line, it says there, and the views of your group are being given proper consideration. On what basis was that put into the letter? Uh, when I signed it, and obviously the, I didn't write this draft, but when I signed it, I took that to mean that the officials who had drafted the response had attended the meeting that James had with the APPG and therefore had a record of the views that they had raised at that meeting. That's how I read that sentence. Right, so you just took it at face value, did you, that the views of the group were being given proper consideration by officials within the building regulations division? Yeah, I, I sorry. I, the letter was drafted by somebody in the building regulations team, so I took that as saying that one of the team had gone with James to the meeting with the group, which is what I would have expected to have happened, and that therefore the views of the group were being considered as the, as the team were drafting the discussion document. Yes. Help us with this. Couldn't the APBG's concerns have informed any such discussion document or statement? Well, that's what I assumed was happening. If, if I think I'm right in saying, I didn't know this at the time, but I think I'm right in saying that an official did go with James to the meeting and therefore that they, the official had taken a note of the concerns that the APPG had raised, and therefore my assumption was those points were being fed into the drafting of the discussion document. I see. But why, help us with this, why, as a minister with no background in building regulations or fire, did you decide that it wasn't helpful or necessary to meet with this group in October when Parliament returned, as they had suggested? Wouldn't that have been not just a useful meeting, but actually quite an important meeting for you with no background in this area to have attended. So it would definitely have been useful to meet the APPG and it was absolutely my intention to do so. I accepted the advice of officials and I think if you put me back in the same situation again without knowing what I know, I would have done so again, that it was better to have the meeting once the discussion document was there and we used the meeting to explore the issues in the discussion document. <coughs> Now, what then happens is two, two very important things. One, the timetable for the publication of the white paper slips. So the timetable for the publication of the discussion document slips. And secondly, David's response to this letter, which you're about to come on to, goes missing. So a meeting that should have happened before Christmas ends up never actually happening before the election is called. Um, but actually, I don't think at this moment in time when I write this letter, the decision I've taken is unreasonable to wait. If I think the discussion document is coming pretty shortly, to have the meeting once that document is there and we can have an informed discussion based on what's in that discussion document, I think makes sense. I see. But just to be absolutely clear, that was on the assumption, was it, that 
the APPG's concerns, as previously raised, had already been absorbed and digested yes. as part of the discussion document. Yes, if you like, we'd, we'd captured the concerns, and then once the document was out, you could have a meeting to get their response to the document and, and see what their views were about how best to take things forward. That was exactly the assumption, yes. Yes. Um, now, as at the date of responding to the APPG, that's 14th of November 2016, you had already approved a finance submission from Andrew Newton uh, in September 2016, which confirmed that the research stage for reviewing approved document B would not be completed until 2019. Now, you can take that from me, but I can, I can show you the submission and I can show you the, the um, annexes to it, which show that timeline. Now, were you aware of that when you responded, that in fact you had already approved a timeline which showed that the research stage would not be completed until 2019? Well, I'm surprised at it now, and therefore I'm, I, I probably wasn't aware of it at the time. My recollection, although I'm probably thinking about the March uh, 2017 submission, is that the the work on approved document B could be done on a faster timescale during 2018. So, yeah. so what you've said is a bit of a surprise to me, but I'm, well, I'm let's sure look you're at accurately that. quoting to me what, I've, what well, you've got in front of you. So Yeah, let's go to CLG 30019370. This was another submission that you got uh, in September 2016, which is about agreement to procure research contracts. Um, and on page one, we can see the purpose. This submission seeks minister's agreement to procure research to support simplification and deregulation of the building regulations, as well as addressing some priority technical issues and EU requirements. And then if you turn on to page nine, there's a timetable set for delivery. And um, we can see that the timetable ends in May 2019. Do you see that? I do. Does it say anywhere in the submission that this research is critical for the work on approved document B? Well, it's analytical and economic support to develop the evidence base to support policy on the building regulation simplification. So it seems to cover the whole suite of approved documents and building regulations. Okay. It doesn't break it down into approved document B specifically. Okay. But um, it sounds like you didn't have that in mind when you were going back to the APPG. Is that fair? It is fair, but also whoever drafted the reply presumably didn't have that in mind necessarily. No. And it doesn't fit the timetable in the March uh, 2017 document either, so uh, I, I struggle to explain that. Yes, yeah, so you can't help as to why you don't come straight with the APPG and tell them that you are still significantly off being able to produce a revised version of the approved documents. Well, I don't think at the point... Um, at which I'm doing that, I'm aware of the timetable for producing that, because I don't think until the March sub I know that timetable. Right. So I don't think it's a question of not being straight with them. And David was a friend and a colleague, and I, I wouldn't ever have deliberately misled him about a timetable. Um, I don't think I knew what the timetable was then for the approved document until the March submission. What was your awareness of the timetable for the discussion document at this point? So, that we, that we should proceed with it as quickly as possible after the white paper. And as I said, I was, we were hoping, sorry, I'm going too fast again. We were hoping that the white paper would be produced end of November, early December at that point, and then the discussion document follow as quickly as possible afterwards. Yes. Now, you say in your second statement, this is page 13, paragraph 32, with hindsight, I should have taken a meeting with the APPG in the autumn. I think you mean the autumn of 2016. Okay. What do you know now uh, that you didn't know then in terms of why a meeting with the APPG was an important thing to do? So I, I tried to explain that uh, a couple of minutes ago. I think that the two things that changed significantly, that, that I didn't know, if you like, were first that the timing of the publication of the white paper was going to slip because it proved very problematic to get cross-government agreement to the text of that white paper. So that delayed uh, the work on the publication on the discussion document. And then, and you're going to come on to this, I'm sure, in a second, David writes a response letter to the letter that we've just been discussing, my reply to him, uh, and that letter uh, is problematic in two regards. 
one, it flags up to me much more bluntly the sort of chain of pushback he's been getting from the department. But second, the letter never comes to me. I never receive it. So it's not till he chases in the new year um, that I become aware of that. And as a result, a meeting that I intended to take place in December or early January doesn't actually get to take place before the election is called. Yes. So that's, when I say with hindsight, that's what I didn't know at the time. I accepted the advice not to do the meeting straight away. Now, um, in November 2016, you also have some correspondence with Brandon Lewis. Let's look at that. This is at CLG 3019380. This is a letter uh, from Brandon Lewis MP. We can see in the top right-hand corner that by this time he's the Minister of State for Policing and the Fire Service. It's dated the 15th of November 2016. And if we go on the first page, it reads, Dear Gavin, I'm writing to you about the department's long-standing commitment to review approved document B, which provides advice on the measures that are needed to meet the functional requirements of the fire safety provisions of the building regulations. Although the guidance includes amendments from 2010 and 2013, it has not been formally reviewed since 2006, despite the commitment of the Right Honourable Eric Pickles in his 2013 response to the coroner, who led the inquest into the cause of fatalities in the 2009 Lackanel House fire. As Minister with Responsibility for the Fire Service, I recognise the role that building regulations have played in reducing the number of fire-related deaths, a figure that has recently reached historically low levels. However, the slight increase in the 2015-16 fire statistics has reminded us, so should one be necessary, of the need to not become complacent and to explore how we can better protect people from fire. And then he goes on, my officials met recently with representatives from the Fire Sector Federation who highlighted that the following areas are causing concern within the fire sector. And we can see at one, the need to simplify the language used in the statutory guidance. Two, changes in construction technology, in particular increased use of combustible materials. And three, mitigating the risks associated with an increasingly ageing population and fire safety in specialised housing. Statistics show there's a disproportionate number of casualties in these facilities. And then reviewing the case for fire suppression in systems in res residential and commercial buildings. Then five, whether there's a case for extending the scope of the current regulatory framework to incorporate, incorporate property protection. Now, do you remember receiving this letter from Brandon Lewis? Uh, I don't remember receiving it, but I definitely did. Um, were you aware that Bob Ledsom and one of the Home Office's directors, Dan Greaves, had met and had decided together to try and progress the review of the approved document in this way by raising it with their respective ministers? Were you ever told that background? At the time. Yes, at the time. No. Were you told that? I know, it, I know it now, but at the time, no. So did this letter just come out of the blue yes. to you? Yes. And... Uh, I note that Brandon, in his um, written evidence, says that he doesn't even remember this correspondence. Um, so I, I read this as that he had met with the Fire Sector Federation and wanted to pass on the feedback that they had given to make sure that that informed the work that he knew was going on. Right. Or his officials, rather, had met with yes. representatives of the Fire Sector Federation. But in terms of your reading of it, again, the delay in reviewing approved document B, despite the commitment following the Lacanel inquest, is being flagged, this time, from one of your fellow ministers, yes? So I think if, if Brandon had been unhappy with the reply that I sent him to this, which I presume we'll come on to in a second, he would have come and spoken to me personally. We knew each other very well. So I, I read this as a fairly standard piece of interdepartmental correspondence where his officials have had a meeting, they've been given some feedback, which if anything, reinforced the point that the issues here were not just about simplification of approved document B, but there were some underlying technical issues that, that needed to be looked at as well, and that these needed to be fed into the review. And, and my reply basically, I think, says, thank you, and we will make sure these things are considered alongside it. What I didn't know, as, as per your question just now, 
is that Bob and his equivalent in the Home Office had sort of arranged this correspondence, which, now that I do know that, is a quite worrying sign of dysfunction that they felt it necessary to do that. Yes. Um, but, but looking at what you are being told here about the dates, it's not been, ADB's not been formally reviewed since 2006, despite the commitment from Eric Pickles in 2013. Now, did you think to ask for an explanation for the delay and the steps which were in place to speed up this review? Uh, no, because I knew at this point that the work was ongoing and I was expecting the discussion document to be published imminently. Right. We see here concerns being raised about changes in construction technology, and that's been raised with you previously, including by the, the Sprinkler uh, Association. Did you notice that pattern of concern about uh, changes in construction technology? I'm not sure if I noticed the, the pattern, but I certainly would have picked up the points that are referenced here in, in the letter uh, and, wanted, and, and would have wanted to make sure that the discussion document was addressing these issues. What did you understand the reference to combustible materials to mean? Did you know what products that was referring to? Uh, no, I suspect probably I would have assumed it was increasing use of timber in buildings. Right. So you didn't seek to understand from your officials what might be met, meant by combustible materials other than timber? I don't think I needed to do that in, in order to respond to this letter. The point at which I needed to understand those issues was... Um, the discussion document and then the response to it in terms of the policy changes. Did you seek to understand the types of buildings which were seeing an increase in combustible materials being used? No, again, th this to me was a piece of interdepartmental correspondence where Home Office officials are trying to make sure that CLG officials are taking into account the issues that have been raised with them by the Fire Sector Federation. So. When the draft reply came to me, I didn't see it as something that I needed to look into at that point in time. Well, I saw it as just wanting to check that our officials were responding positively, that these issues would be considered as part of the review. And did you get a commitment from your officials that the issues raised in this letter would be reflected in the discussion document? Well, I think that my reply basically says that, but I don't have it in front of me. Well, let's look at your reply. It's at CLG 3014819. Here's your response. It's dated the 28th of November, 2016. And you say, Dear Brandon, thank you for your letter of the 15th of November in which you asked me about our plans to review the fire safety aspects of building regulations and where you reiterated some of the concerns that had been raised with you by the Fire Sector Federation. I am aware of the commitment that the Right Honourable Eric Pickles made in 2013 to look at the guidance that supports these requirements with the intention of making it easier to use and understand. Now, pausing there, you'd never actually seen a copy of the commitment Eric Pickles had made, had you? No, but I'm not saying that. I'm saying I'm aware of it. Yes, but you haven't actually seen the text of it, have you? <coughs> And then it goes on, however, this is one of many pressures on the building regulations and the building control system, and we have been considering all of these pressures in the round before making a statement on our next steps. We are currently proposing to produce a discussion paper which will set out the policy background, the drivers for change, and our current thinking. Whilst it will not include any firm proposals, it will give people an opportunity to comment on emerging ideas and priorities for our programme of work. My officials have been in discussion with yours on the content of the discussion paper. The draft now also includes reference to the potential for them to work together to streamline the guidance that supports the regulatory reform fire safety order, which is around, also around 10 years old. I hope to write around soon, seeking collective agreement for publishing the discussion paper. So that was the response. So uh, I think you said earlier this was a draft that was prepared for you by officials, yes? And that you uh, approved? Yeah, I don't know if I made any small amendments, but yes, obviously, I wouldn't have just written this from scratch. It would have, it would have come up uh, with a draft reply. And in terms of specific work on the approved documents, did you understand that only to consist of work on the discussion document at this time? Yes. You say there that making the guidance easier to use and understand was one of many pressures on the building regulations and the building control system. 
And in your first witness statement, you explain that those other pressures, including disability, accessibility, and environmental performance. Is that correct? Yeah, and also um, there were issues that I've referred to earlier in my evidence today about competition in building control and concerns about uh, compliance. So there were, there were a whole suite of issues here that we were trying to look at in the round. Why did you not assure Mr Lewis that the five concerns he had raised would be considered in the next review of the building regulations? I, well, I, I took that to be implicit in the first sentence of the last paragraph, that the a draft has come up from my officials saying that they're talking to the Home Office officials about the content of the discussion paper. Right. So I, I assumed implicitly that meant that message received and we are engaging on that work. Okay, well we'll look at that when we see the final draft of the discussion document. Um, why was it that the discussion paper was not going to include any firm proposals, as you mentioned here in the penultimate paragraph? Did you understand why that was? Yes, my understanding was that the whole purpose of a discussion document was to flag up the range of issues and try and get feedback on where priorities fraction uh, were. So the March submission goes into more detail about the steps that you would then need to go through once you'd got the response to that discussion document. And thinking about the timeline at this stage, when did you understand that the department would be making firm proposals in contrast to just putting out a discussion document? Uh, I hadn't I hadn't got absolute clarity about that at this point, but I was assuming it was um, some months after the publication of the discussion document. The March submission, when we come on to that, gives a clear timeline. Now, if we look at paragraph 14 of your first witness statement on page four, and I want to pick it up in the second line, second sentence, uh, where you're dealing with this correspondence, you, you say, officials in the department will have drafted this response for me to sign off. Reflecting on my response now, I recall that by the time of these exchanges, I'd already had an initial policy discussion with my officials and had accepted that the response to the coroner's outstanding recommendation would be taken forward as part of the broader review. Now, um, just help us, when you say the part of the broader review, part of what broader review? Of the, of the whole system, the, what the discussion document was, was covering. So the building regulations, the building control system, yes. all of that. Yeah. Yes, I see. And who had you spoken to about that? So I, I don't know that. I, I think I touched on this in um, the evidence this morning. I think probably the decision was taken in relation to the September submission that you questioned me about earlier, uh, where it wasn't actually that we decided to wrap it in with that. It was almost that previous ministers had taken that decision and we endorsed it, I think would be a more accurate statement than the way maybe I phrased it in this witness statement. But I think probably it was that September submission that confirmed that. I see. Or our response to that September submission. And was there any pressure to do that to further the government's deregulatory agenda? No. I don't think the submission was suggesting that that was the rationale for it. It was saying previous ministers have decided to look at this issue in the round. The mistake, I think, which we touched on earlier on, was the assumption that there wasn't anything sort of safety critical in the commitments that had been made in relation to the coroner, and therefore you could fold it into a, a wider, longer-term programme of work. That clearly was a mistake. Yes. And, and then in this last, the last part of this paragraph, you say, and, and again, you touched on it earlier, and I want to ask you about it. You say, Brandon Lewis was my predecessor in the ministerial role, and I was confident that he would have raised any concerns about this approach to building regulations with me. He did not raise any further concerns. Now, can we agree that Mr. Lewis did not, in fact, have the same suite of ministerial responsibilities as you, as we looked at? This, earlier this morning, he was responsible for housing and planning, but not the building regulations. Yes? We, we can definitely agree that, but he was the previous housing minister. He was a close personal friend. He was now the fire minister. I mean, the thing, the thing that is curious about this now, knowing what we know now, <laughs> is that if um, Bob Ledson wanted to raise the profile of this work on approved document B, why didn't a submission come up to me saying, we think we should separate this off and get on with this, rather than wrapping it into the rest of the programme, which I would have, I'm sure, agreed with, 
rather than go through this rather <clears throat> bizarre process of working with a Home Office official to send a letter between Brandon and I, which didn't then actually have the desired effect because his own team, when they drafted the response, drafted the response that we've just been discussing. Mm -hmm. It is a slightly dysfunctional, odd way to go about these things, which I'm at a loss to explain. Yes. But your predecessor, who'd had responsibility for the building regulations, as we know, was James Wharton. Did you discuss with James Wharton and check what he thought and whether this was a sensible approach? Because you said, oh, Brandon Lewis could be expected to raise it, but he didn't have the building regulations in his portfolio. No, but he, he was the fire minister, so if he felt that my response to the letter, or his officials felt that my response to the letter was inadequate, I would have absolutely expected him to speak to me about it. Ministers do that all the time. If, they, if there's some correspondence and you get a letter from a fellow minister that you think has completely missed the point you were trying to make, you don't write to them again. You go and speak to them and say, look, I think you've missed the point here. Can you go back and push your officials on this? In terms of James, as I said, I should have had a handover with him. I acknowledged that earlier on when you were questioning me. But he was obviously happy with this approach because he was one of the people that had made the decision to wrap the work into this wider review. Right. Mr Chairman, I think that's a good moment for our afternoon break, if that's OK. Because I'm about to go on to <coughs> uh, a, a separate subject. Yes, all right. Well, um, I think that probably is a good time. No, Barwell, we'll have a break at this point. We'll come back at 25 to 4, please. And <coughs> as before, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence while you're out of the room. Of course. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Would you like to go with the usher, then, please? Thank you. 25 to 4, then, Ms. Thank you. Thank you.
Would you ask Lord Barwell to come back in, please? Thank you. Right, Lord Barwell, I'm ready to carry on. Ready to carry on. Very good. Thank you very much. Yes, Ms. Grange. Yes, I, I want to go forward now to March 2017 when you saw the final draft of the discussion document. If we can go to CLG 3019392. We can see here that on the 23rd of March 2017, there's a submission to you from Richard Harrell cleared by Bob Ledsom, and it's to you and the Secretary of State, Sajid Javid, about the building regulations and the discussion document. And it says under purpose, paragraph one, ministers previously approved development of a discussion document setting out the potential scope of work on building regulations policy over coming years. This submission seeks ministers agreement on the proposed scope as set out in the final draft discussion document at Annex A. And then we can see that paragraph two, it says timing routine, yes? Yes. And then if we turn to the bottom of page three, we see under the first, uh, sorry, there's a heading at the bottom of that page, key risks and issues. And paragraph 13 says, changes to building regulations, whether new reg regulation or deregulation, have significant consequences for society and business. A summary is provided at Annex B. Issues likely to be of most interest of which ministers should be aware include... And then there is a bullet point saying the 2013 coroner's report on the fire at Lacanau House fire criticised the clarity of the guidance on Part B, fire safety. And in response to this, the then Secretary of State, Eric Pickles, committed to review it. We have started work on a redraft, as recommended by the coroner, but we will need to work with industry to take this further. There are regular calls on the government to set out when and how this work will be taken forward. We have constrained the proposed scope of the review of Part B to areas of highest priority, but the fire lobby is powerful and there will be pressure to do more. Yes? Yes. Now, did you notice that this submission referred to the coroner having asked, having criticised the clarity of the guidance in approved document B, not just asking for simplification? Uh, go back a page and look I don't it. know whether I noticed that at the time. I noticed it when you just read it then. I'm not sure if I really see a huge difference between clarity and simplification personally, but I accept what you say. How did you understand the proposed scope of the review had been constrained to areas of highest priority? That's what it says uh, over the page uh, in the rest of that I, bullet point. I've tried to avoid using this phrase, but at, at this point in time, I can't recall what was said in the meeting about what were the areas that hadn't been included. Now, on page... I mean, the whole... Sorry, just to finish the answer. The whole document, um, there were some constraints on scope because I think if you go a bit further down the submission, it lists other areas of the building regulations that, they cho that we chose not to include right, in I the see. discussion document. Now, going back to page one and paragraph uh, three... We see that Mr. Harrell recommended that you meet with officials to review the content of the discussion document. Did you actually do that? I don't think we did have a meeting. There's not a record of it in the bundle, but I would find it very surprising if there wasn't a discussion, either at one of the Monday meetings or a specific meeting. But I can't find a reference to a meeting uh, in any of the papers that have been provided to me before this appearance, before the inquiry. The reason I think it would be surprising... Uh, if there wasn't a meeting, is that when you become a minister, almost the first thing that happens is your private secretary phones you up and asks you how you want your office to run, which I found a rather strange question because I didn't know what the available options were. But I discovered that I liked to make decisions if it was an important matter through discussion at a meeting rather than just reading a note in my box. If it was a, a fairly routine submission where the department was saying we'd like to commission this piece of research that's important. I, would, I was always happy to look at that as box paperwork, but if it was something more important, my preference was always to discuss it. So I'm afraid I can't answer your question definitively. My view is I would have probably had a discussion, but the, the feedback from my private secretary doesn't refer to a meeting and I couldn't find any evidence of a meeting no. in the papers that were provided to me. Now, did you read the final version of the discussion document carefully at this stage? I'm sure I will have read it, but I haven't reread it because it wasn't provided to me in the bundle of papers. Okay. 
We'll look at it in a moment. But first, let's look at an email that's sent af after this, CLG 30030961. And we look at the top email in the chain. It's an email from Office of Gavin Barwell to Tim Lunig. Do you see that there? Yes, I can see it. Uh, together with all advisors on the building regulations discussion document, dated the 18th of April 2017 at 9.52. And it said, Gavin was content with the recommendations in this sub, particularly interested in the work in parts B and M. Any thought, Tim, Nick, question mark, Chiron? Do you see that? I do. Now, um, do you remember why you were particularly interested in the work on part B on fire safety? Yes, I do. Uh, so it comes back to a question you asked me quite near the start of these proceedings um, when you were probing me on the role of ministers to apply judgment to the advice that comes from officials. So these were the two areas of the building regulations where I'd received some pressure from parliamentary colleagues and others that work was required, part B, for the obvious reasons that you know only too well, particularly the APPG correspondence. Yeah. And part M, uh, I think I had taken part in a I think it was the Women and Equality Select Committee had done uh, a hearing on accessible housing and pushed quite hard that the standards in Part M needed improvement. So the reason that my private secretary, Kieran, my private secretary, who's replying to this, the reason he's flagged up those two is because I've given him a clear steer that those are the two areas where I feel politically there's significant pressure to move rapidly. Right. Do you know whether your private office ever communicated to Mr Ledsom and Mr Harrell your approval of this submission to officials? So I'd be amazed if they didn't, but there's no record of it in the document bundle. No, there's no record of you having done so. And Richard Harrell told us in his witness statement that he never had a response from you to this submission. So it's very difficult to explain why that would be true, because you can see from this email that I have read it and given feedback to my private secretary and was happy with it. Yes. Well, we put this to, to Mr. Harrell. We showed it him, but he said, well, that's not the same as uh, giving approval to us. That's him saying to other advisers, what do you think? You know, I'm content yeah. with it, but what do you think? So, um, I mean, is it possible there was a problem with your private office communicating your agreement to this? So it's, it's very difficult for me to answer that question. It's possible that private office wanted to get feedback from the advisers before giving the response to the department but it's not a question I can answer. All I know is that I had given feedback to my private office saying that I was content with the recommendations and wanted to proceed. I was well aware that this was late. Our original intention, as I said to you earlier, original intention had been to publish after conference and then I'd been hoping to do it around the new year. So this was late and I wanted to get on with it. And I don't understand if there, if there genuinely wasn't any feedback and I trust Richard, if that's what he's told you in his evidence, I have no explanation as to why that feedback wasn't given to the relevant officials. Yeah. Certainly wasn't in my direction. I wanted yes. to get on with it. Yes. Well, can we have a look at the evidence, uh, the oral evidence of Richard Harrell? Uh, this is day 244. I want to go to page 19. And I want to pick it up at around page, uh, line 20. Um, and he says this, he says, um, that's all we cared about at the time, but we had been ready to put this up in September 2016, pretty much. So he's talking about the discussion document submission and it had been delayed. There's a submission to Gavin Barwell in September. So maybe early October 2016, we were probably ready to go with this. But we were, I was told that the minister wouldn't be looking at anything other than the highest priority submissions until the housing and planning white paper was published. That was originally scheduled to be published in late October, early November. And so you go, right, okay, that's another three or four weeks. We will live with that if that's the decision. But actually, it wasn't until the middle of February that it was then published. And it was a constant process in that period of it will be next week, another week, you know. So you're constantly saying, well, OK, we can wait another week. It will take us much longer to try and look at doing this another way. So what I'm trying to say is that at least probably five months of the delay is down to decisions made in Mr. Barwell's private office. 
Do you see that? I do. And then below that, um, I say right, and then he says, and it would not be appropriate to actually start. It wouldn't just not be appropriate. It would be quite destructive to our relationship with that private office if we start pointing fingers and saying, this is delayed because of the decisions of your private office. Do you see that? I do. So this is where we, we were questioning him about why he didn't escalate these submissions and get them into your private office with some urgency. And that's the explanation he gave. So effectively, he's saying your private office wasn't going to be looking at anything that wasn't a priority, and that priority was the planning and housing white paper. Is that fair? So I think there's, there's two different bits to what you've just put to me. Uh, the first bit is basically fair other than it wasn't just my private office, it was the Secretary of State's private office as well. We had taken a collective decision mm -hmm. to prioritise uh, the housing white paper. Now, there's some, I haven't seen this piece of evidence until you've just showed it in me, to me. There's something there which is of interest to me, which is that the reasoning we had been given for why to delay the discussion document was that the department couldn't proceed with both at once. But he appears to be saying in his evidence that actually this was ready. Yes. Um, so that's news to me. But anyway, the first section that you put to me, I think, is basically fair, other than that it was a collective decision of the Secretary of State and myself. I, I don't want it blamed just on the officials in my private office. We had decided to prioritise the white paper first. That is true. The second bit from line 17 to 22... Um, ..surprises me a little bit. I mean, I suppose it speaks to the culture within the department that he didn't feel able to come and say this delay is a problem and I'd like to at least sit down with the minister and see if we can unpick the decision on timing because it's causing us a problem. From my point of view, I would have, I would have hoped that my private office would allow him to do that. If he was, you know, it sounds like he was concerned about the escalating delay. I was too. I didn't know that the document was ready. So if it was really just a question of the Secretary of State and myself finding time to read it, that's a different matter from the department having capacity to do it. Yeah. So I can't really explain that second bit, but the first bit is basically fair, other than that it was a collective decision, not just the officials in my private office. Yes. Well, it, it appears for both parts that there's a, a total failure of communication, doesn't there? In that he, he says it's ready and it's going up and he's talking to your private office, but he's being kicked back. Your understanding was we'd all agreed it wasn't going to come up until later. Whatever, whatever the truth... Of, of that, there does seem to have been a total breakdown in communication between that department and your private office, yes? Yeah, but not just, not just in the way that you're suggesting, I think a little bit wider, because I would have also been expecting him to be having this conversation with Steve Quartermain and with Helen McNamara. Yeah. Um, so the same problem, it wouldn't just be a question of coming to my private office, because if, he'd, if Richard had gone to Bob and then Bob to Steve and to Helen, and they agreed actually that the timetable should be changed, Helen or Steve would have come to talk to me about it. So it speaks to me about communication problems wider than just Richard to my private office. Yes. Now help us with this. The housing white paper was published on the 7th of February 2017. Why was the discussion document not published either at that point or very shortly thereafter? So I, the, we've lost the, the sub that we were looking at. I think from memory, the date of the submission coming up to me of the final discussion document is 23rd March, if my memory is not playing That's tricks with correct. me. correct, it is. So I have no explanation to you as to why, if this document was ready, it didn't come up on the 8th of February, as soon as the white paper was out of the way. I have no explanation to you as to why that delay has come about, because I wanted to get on with it, because it was, it had, you know, yeah. the first part of what you've put to me is true. We had delayed it because of the white paper. Yes. Can we agree this is wholly unsatisfactory? Yes. Yes. Now, we don't need to go to it, but at paragraph 18 of your first statement, you say that on the same day that this, the email that we looked at that Tim Lunig uh, sent, 18th of April 2017, on that same day where he said you were broadly content but you were asking others what they thought, the Prime Minister announced she would call a parliamentary vote to hold an early general election. Yes. Yes. And you go on to explain that the PERDA period began on the 22nd of April 2017 and thereafter only urgent work routinely came to you for a response. So the discussion document could not be published during the, the election campaign. Yes? That, if that's the way I've phrased it, I'm slightly conflating two things. Um, so 
the, the PERDA period basically stops the government making significant announcements. And the reason for that is obvious. If you're in the middle of an election campaign, you don't want to give an unfair advantage to the government where it could do a budget or announce some other very attractive policy to try and get people to vote for it in the election. So the PERDA period prevents government from making significant policy announcements. Uh, and then on top of that, obviously, I, as an MP in a marginal seat, was campaigning in my constituency, so I was only dealing with urgent correspondence of that period. But right. the per in terms of this document that you're asking me about, it's the PERDA period that's the key thing. And do we take it that nobody ever considered that this do discussion document had become urgent by that point? So, so urge urgent doesn't include a sort of major policy document like this discussion document. You, you, there's no way you would be allowed to publish that by Cabinet Office during a general election campaign. Right. Now, the discussion document itself, the final version that you saw, is at CLG, can we bring it up, CLG 3019391. Now, at the time of the Grenfell Tower fire on the 14th of June 2017, this document remained unpublished. But I nevertheless want to ask you about what you thought when you saw it. Now, the section in relation to Part B starts on page 24, and it covers around three and a half pages of this discussion document on fire safety. And we can see that the priorities for potential review of the technical requirements and the approved documents are set out. And paragraph 81 reads this. Um, Given the potentially significant extent of simplification of the approved documents in this parliament, it is thought best to limit any changes to technical requirements only to those areas which support simplification or deregulation or where a compelling case is made that current requirements need to be amended, i.e. are no longer fit for purpose. A longer term program of review could then be developed for each of the approved documents. Now, having read that, is it fair to say that this meant that the department was only really considering making changes if it meant simplification or deregulation, or where there was a compelling case for no fitness for purpose? Is that, is that fair? Yes in terms of the immediate changes. So uh, you'd need to refer back to the March submission, but I think what what's said in the, in the covering submission to the paper is they were trying to look for an approach where you could do something on approved document B relatively quickly, still not quick enough given what we now know about the urgency of the issue, and then also work on some further longer term changes down the line. Yes. Now, the section uh, dealing with Part B begins at the bottom of this page, and if we scroll through the headings, um, I covered them, some of them with you earlier in relation to the draft of this document, but if we go over on the next page, we can see there's headings about property protection for different types of buildings, specialised housing at the bottom of that page, then if we go over the next page, smoke alarms over the next page, basements, means of escape for disabled people, and links with the fire safety order. Those are the topics. And then if we go over the next page, we can see that's the totality of what's covered under Part B. <coughs> now, I, I want yes or no answers to these. Can we agree that there is no reference in this document to combustible materials? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say yes. I'll have to take your word for it. This document wasn't shared with me before I came and gave evidence today. It would have been much helpful if, I, if I'd had the opportunity to read it before being asked questions about it, because you've just gone through three or four pages very quickly there. Yes. Well, there's no reference either to new technology in construction um, either I, that we can see. I can't answer your question. I understand. So well, I, you I'm that. sure you're honestly telling me you've read the document. I haven't. I, I'm not going to dispute what you're saying, but I haven't had the opportunity to read this document. Now, you told us earlier in relation to the Brandon Lewis correspondence from November 2016 that you had understood that your officials were going to take forward the matters he'd raised in bullet points in that letter into this discussion document, yes? Yes. Can you help us why we don't see that here? We don't see changes in construction technology and we don't see the increased use of combustible materials being addressed at all. So I can only assume that the Home Office had changed its view on that because this document wouldn't be published unless it had right round approval from the Home Office. So I can't explain to you why they're absent and I can't remember a discussion about that. But in order for this document to be published, it would need right round approval. So it would have to go to the Home Office. So. It may be that the Home Office were happy to deal with those issues as part of the longer term bit of work that you were just asking me about rather than the immediate one. I don't know. 
Yes. Did you um, take the, the Brandon Lewis correspondence while you were reading this discussion document and just check for yourself that the matters that he'd raised with you that were of concern to the Fire Sexist Federation were reflected in this discussion document? Uh, I think I would have assumed that that work had gone on between officials. Did you... I mean, Query, I'm, why? To, to be honest with you, I may not have even remembered the fact that that correspondence had happened, given the volume of letters that I was signing. I would have remembered the APPG correspondence because that had been a chain of letters that had embarrassed me because we'd, we'd missed so many of the letters and failed to have the meeting. But I can't guarantee to you that at the point I read this document, I would have necessarily had in my mind the Brandon Lewis correspondence. Did you um, check with officials that the key concerns that had been raised historically by the APPG, including about approved document B, were reflected in this discussion document? Um, I, I can't remember that because I can't remember if we had a meeting to discuss it. But you don't have any recollection of checking those things? I don't have a recollection of the discussion. And we don't have a record of whether there was a meeting in the document bundle. I would be amazed if I didn't ask about that because the APPG thing was very much in my mind. Yes. And if we look at paragraph 85 on page 24, back to that, there's more information here about statistical uh, uh, deaths from fire and it says the reduction in the number of fires and associated deaths and injuries means we have a continuing success story on fire safety in the past decade the number of fires attended in homes has fallen by 64 percent and accidental fire deaths have decreased by 36 percent however despite the progress made we must not be complacent now um if we turn to clg 13008566 Um, here we've got an email at the top of this from um, Tim Lunig um, on the 19th of September 2016. He emails your private secretary and Sajid Javid's private secretary and Claire Brunton copying in all advisers. The title is the discussion document. So this will be in relation to the previous draft of the discussion document. And in the fourth paragraph, he says... Uh, FWIW, for what it's worth, do we know whether the falls in fire deaths are anything to do with building fire standards, or are they caused by furniture standards ch changing or falls in the number of people smoking at home, having open chip pans, question mark? Presumably, if the number of deaths in older houses has gone down at the same rate, it's nothing, in capitals, to do with building safety standards, in which case the regs have achieved nothing. Do we have data on this? Could we have it? even a postcode proxy would be useful. Now, do you remember this discussion ever going on in your presence about whether these statistics told you anything? No, and, and this email is addressed to my private secretary, but I don't recall seeing it. And then if we go to a different email chain, CLG 13008570, there's an email from Bob Ledsom at the bottom of page one dated the 27th of September at 1428. And we see he copies and pastes the paragraph we've just looked at, and he sends it to Brian Martin, copied to Richard mm -hmm. Harrell, and, and asks, does our data allow us to answer these questions? And then if we go to the next email up in the chain, we see that Mr. Martin responds, uh, and he says, as discussed, some words on this if you need them, and then he goes on, as you suggest, the reduction, the total number of reported fires is mostly attributable to a number of factors not related to building standards. Do you see that? I do. And then he goes on. We don't need the detail of that. Now, were you ever told that the reduction in the total number of reported fires had nothing to do with building standards at the time you considered the discussion document, either in September 16 or in March 17? Was I ever told that? Yes. No. Sorry, I'm just trying to read the email again. This is another document that I haven't been provided with. Yes. No, I mean, we, we wanted to know whether the statistics that appear in the discussion document were ever contextualised, given it was dealing with approved document B in the building regulations. And it doesn't sound like they were. Is that fair? That, yes, that is fair, yeah.
did you ever consider whether the guidance in approved document B took account of the risks posed by modern methods of construction and provide adequate life safety protection where such methods were used? No, because no submissions ever came to me on that issue. Yeah. Now, we've seen from the documents, and you've referred to some of it, and I, I can't take you to all of it because we don't have time, that there was more correspondence from the APPG yes. in the autumn of 2016 and in February 2017, including more requests to meet you. Yes. And I just want to pick this up again a bit later in April 2017, and I want to go to a letter of response that you write on the 5th of April 2017. It's at CLG... Three zeros one nine four two eight. So here um, you say, Dear David, so it's back to David Amos, thank you for your letter of 20th of February on behalf of the All Party Parliamentary Fire Safety and Rescue Group. I'm sorry you've not received a reply to your letters of the 7th and the 22nd of November. My officials have investigated and found that we have no record of them. And then you say this, you say, I'm most concerned that on two separate occasions, a letter from your office to mine regarding the concerns of the Balmoral Residents Association seems to have been lost in transit. This is clearly unacceptable. And I wonder if you could arrange to either email the letter or have it delivered by hand so I can respond without further delay. And then in the next paragraph, you go on, I'm not sure I accept your view that the comments in my previous letter to you and subsequently in the House are inconsistent. They'd accused you of being inconsistent in terms of what you'd said in October 16 and what you'd said in one of your previous letters. And you go on, however, I do acknowledge that producing a statement on building regulations has taken longer than I envisaged. As such, I think it would be appropriate to meet with the all-party group at the next opportunity. I would be grateful if you could call my office on and you give the number of your office to make the necessary arrangements. In your letter, you also bring my attention to your correspondence with the Chancellor of the Exchequer. I confirm I've seen, I've seen the original correspondence. Now, tell us this. Why, once you knew that the housing white paper was delayed, and so the promise meeting with the APPG was also going to be delayed, why didn't you update them yourself uh, in the autumn or in early 2017, explain the position and say, actually, why don't we have a meeting now? Why, why didn't you do that? So I think at that point, I'd only had one letter from the APPG that I'd seen, and the commitment I'd made to meet them probably was in front of my mind. Uh, if you look at the two, if you look at this letter, the 7th of November letter is a little bit of a misnomer because that was a, it was another chase for the original response that crossed with my original response. Yes, it was. All right, but the 22nd of November letter is very significant. Because if you, if you were to put that up on screen, you would see that David expresses real frustration with my response and um, vents a little bit that this is a pattern of behaviour he's had from successive housing ministers. Had I seen that correspondence, I think that would have led to what I've done when I finally get, uh, when I finally get to respond to the letter of 20th of February. So for the benefit of the inquiry, the third paragraph of this letter and in particular the last bit of it, is me crossing out the advice officials gave me, which was not it was to delay a meeting again, and saying to him, here's the phone number, phone up, let's arrange a meeting. Yes. And that was out of a mixture of embarrassment at the number of letters that had gone missing, but also real concern at what he'd said in that letter of 22nd November, copied on 20th of February. Yes. Um, so... I have intervened here and changed and gone against the advice I was given by officials in order to try and arrange this meeting. Yes. Um, you tell us in your first statement um, that you had to, as you've just explained, redraft this letter as initially drafted by officials because you were so embarrassed. Um, does it follow that your officials weren't embarrassed about those matters? that it took you to have to change that letter? I'm, I'm not sure if I ever had the discussion directly with officials or not. We touched on this earlier in the, earlier in the evidence session. But I think it probably does follow that the officials didn't think the concerns the APPG were raising were particularly well-founded. That's the only explanation I can think of, of why 
they were still putting back the meeting. Yes. It may be helpful to the inquiry to understand how I approached this issue. Before I was appointed Housing and Planning Minister, I'd been a government whip. And I'd, so th those, are, those are ministers, but they're not policy ministers. They're responsible for basically getting government business through Parliament. And I'd seen in that role what a difference it makes to the government when policy ministers engage with MPs. With Parliament, always the best thing is to treat people with respect, and actually you get a long way then, whereas if you cold shoulder people, they quickly get very annoyed. So I think at the point I saw this, I already regretted not having said yes to the original request and, and felt that this meeting needed to take place as a matter of urgency, hence the very unusual step of giving out the phone number of a minister's private office, which is not standard practice at all. Yes. I'll take you in a moment to that 22nd of November letter that you were just referring to where you say, had you seen it, you, you may have done something earlier. Um, but just sticking with this for a moment, um, did you ever get a satisfactory explanation about why so many of the APPG's letters appeared to go missing? No, I didn't, I didn't try and raise that. This, this letter, I think, is already... I'm just trying to think of how the timing of this interfaces with the election. But I didn't, I didn't get to follow that up with officials. No. Let's look at that letter just for completeness. The November one. You've referred to it. It's RKI 6089. So it's got an RKI um, beginning to this document because I think it was Mr. Ronnie King that provided this to us. Right. And it's dated the 22nd of November 2016. And he says, Dear Gavin, thank you for your letter of 14th November. Uh, in, in reply to my letter of the 17th of October last. I've since written to you on the 7th of November, copy attached, which you may not have yet seen. However, it refers to a reply which you've recently given to a question on the review of building regulations fire safety approved document B, Hansard refers. And then he sets out what was said. And then if we go over the page, he says, this appears to be the first positive response from a minister responsible responsible for building regulations since before the general election in 2015 and doesn't seem to have been mirrored in your response to myself where you say that your intention is to make a statement in due course exclamation mark we've received similar statements previously from james wharton since may 2015 with promises about an announcement in the new year but that was the last new year so you can understand the frustration which the fire and construction sector has over this matter and an early announcement from the department to continue with the already commenced review of approved document B to the building regulations would be most welcomed by all concerned. And of course, in line with your Hansard response to Steve McCabe, MP. Turning now to the previous correspondence with James over the Tablock fire, and then he goes on. I confirm I've not received a, a departmental response. And then he goes on. In summary, the group would urge you to make an early statement on the review of a pre-document B and thereafter to meet with you to discuss this in context, as you suggest. And he says at the bottom, I'm copying with this letter, previous and relevant correspondence for your information. But I think what you're telling us is you never got to see this letter. I, I did get to see it, but not until about the 5th of April. Right. right so this one went missing. Uh, and then I think it's the 20th of February or something, he resends it. Yes. And obviously that doesn't work its way. One of, I'm sure other witnesses have said this to, to, the, to you, but um, when someone writes to you as a minister, you don't get the letter until the reply comes up. So it's not till the reply comes up to me and I see that in early April that I see this letter. And obviously in one sense at that point, I know the discussion. I think I have signed off the discussion document, although you're telling me that that feedback wasn't given to officials necessarily. So I know there's a good answer coming to him on the substance, but I'm mortified that it's taken this long to answer this. And I'm also concerned because he's now set out clearly his previous experience with the previous minister and that this has been dragging on for a long time. So for both, that, for both of those reasons, I wanted to see them as quickly. <coughs> yes. I mean, the problem is it, this all comes too late to your attention. It, and that's one of the key problems, yes? Yes. But had you met with them earlier, they could have filled you in on all of this, couldn't they? Yes. Let's go and just complete the picture on the APPG to CLG 1309026. This is an email chain between uh, Ronnie King of the APPG and your private secretary. If we look at the second email in the chain in the middle of page one, 
It's not very clear, but there's an email. That's better. <laughs> yes, there's an email on the 19th of April 2017 to P.S. Gavin Barwell, subject building regs part B. And picking it up in the second paragraph, Ronnie King says, the minister said five months ago that his intention was to make a statement in due course. He suggested that it would be better and more constructive to wait until after this statement has been made before meeting so that our conversation can be in context. However, he has now agreed to meet and no statement has yet been issued other than that contained in answer to the PQ on the 24th of October, 2017. The group was therefore anticipating a statement and I wondered if the minister was able to make it before meeting the group, especially given the likely perda period about to be imposed as a result of the general election. Kind regards, Ronnie. So he is clearly holding you to your word and saying, where's the statement which you said was going to be important before we met? Yes? Yes. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's slightly ironic that they're now taking the same line that officials were taking of saying better to have the statement before we meet. Well, it's but, I mean, ironic, but, but maybe it's understandable. Maybe they're taking you at your word. I mean, I've never seen this email, either at the time or in the document pack. Right. If I'd seen it, I would have said, I mean, by this point it's too late anyway, but I, I would have said to my brothers, get them in right now and stop this exchange of emails and letters. Yes. The purpose of giving them the phone number was to try and meet with them immediately. Yes. Well, if we go up to the top of the email in the chain, we can see that your private secretary responds to Mr King that same day, the 19th of April 2017 at 2.24pm. And he says, hi, Ronnie, I'm afraid that events have overtaken the possibility of preparing and issuing a statement before PERDA begins. I would advise getting in touch after the election. And in the meantime, I'll ensure our officials are aware. Best wishes, Ed. Do you see that? I do, yeah. Now, uh, it sounds like you didn't discuss that response with your private secretary before it was sent. Is that right? That's right. But, I mean, what he's saying is true. We'd reached a point where we couldn't issue the statement anymore. Right. So Perda wasn't a convenient excuse to brush off the APPG, no. given that you had no plans to make any statement anytime soon. No, with respect, I wasn't trying to brush off the APPG. I'd just given them the, mo the number of my private office because I wanted to meet with them. Yes. So no, I would emphatically uh, refute that. But, I mean, can we agree, looking at the correspondence and the series of events, that... Um, it's pretty unfortunate, isn't it, how the APP was dealt with during your time as minister? Not, just during, not just during my time, over a long period of time. Yes. Uh, and as I said to you in, in the evidence I gave earlier, I deeply regret that I didn't overrule official advice the first time I received the letter, but I did do it the second time I saw it, and I did everything I could to try and get that meeting to happen as quickly as possible. And if it hadn't been for the general election, it would have happened. Yes. I and mean, I think, as you've mentioned, in your time as Minister for Housing, it appears that the APPG wrote seven letters to you, raising a number of substantive concerns, and you wrote three letters back, two of which came several months after the APPG correspondence was first sent. Can we agree that? We, we can, but it's a slightly, if I, if I may say to Council, it's a slightly pejorative way of putting it, because it misses out the fact that some of those letters never came to me. And where they were delayed, it was because there was a delay in the system in them coming to me. So I'm very happy to take responsibility for a bad decision not to meet with them when I got the original letter. But I think after that, I've responded in the right way. I've overruled official advice. I've tried to expedite the meeting as quickly as I can. But can we agree that none of the correspondence that went back to the APPG substantively addressed the concerns about fire safety which the APPG had raised? No, although to be fair, Council, the APPG, what the APPG wanted was to sit down and meet with me to discuss those concerns. It, it wasn't asking for a detailed policy response. What David had wanted all along was to sit down and have a discussion with me and officials about those issues. Right. which is what I wanted to do. But I think, can we agree that historically, had you seen the APPG correspondence, you would have been aware that there were some pretty substantive issues they were raising, that they wanted action on. This wasn't just meeting for meeting's sake. They had real concerns, including about combustible materials and their use on high-rise buildings, that had never substantively been addressed, either by your predecessors or by you. Is that fair? That is fair. And I, I've said to you repeatedly today that I should have cried to the original meeting. Let's look at another letter that you received, albeit quite late in the day. CLG 1309016. If 
This is Danny Cotton's letter, is it? Yes. So we have a letter dated the 3rd of April from Danny Cotton, the London Fire Commissioner, to you. And we can see from the first paragraph that she's introducing herself as the London Fire Commissioner, having taken up her appointment in January 2017. And she also requests at paragraph two, a meeting with you to discuss a number of issues around London's housing stock and the programme for building new properties in the capital. Yes. Is this a letter that you've um, re-familiarised yourself with recently? Yeah, well, not re-familiarised myself. I never saw it, but I am now familiar with it, yes. Let's just look at a little bit of what she says. Um, I, I'm not going to read all of it, but she's basically saying there's a, a real concern about the quality of construction in schools, hospitals and other residential buildings, including in blocks of flats. You can see that in the third paragraph. And if we then pick it up in the paragraph at the bottom of that page, she says this. She says, when compartmentation is missing or incorrectly installed, it can potentially place residents at significant risk. With the Lacknell House fire in 2009, in which six people died, there were compartmentation breaches which allowed fire and smoke to spread through the building, contrary to the functional requirements of the building regulations and in direct conflict with the evacuation strategy for the building. We are deeply concerned that since the beginning of 2017, LFB has identified on average at least one residential property or development in London with significant compartmentation deficiencies per month. These usually come to our attention after a fire or by a person responsible for the property seeking our advice. It is safe to assume that there are many other cases that do not come to our attention, yet are placing the residents of those properties in significant risk from fire spreading within the building. And then she goes on over the page to say that she's very keen to discuss wider issues in relation to the quality of housing, including building regulations that have been put in place to ensure that buildings are built safely. And she raises a concern about the enforcement powers that, uh, for example, the LABC has to take action. And then at the end of that uh, substantive paragraph there, she says in the last sentence, we are also concerned about contractor com competency and how this influences compartmentation deficiencies and therefore occupant safety in respect of fire. And then she says, whilst raised in, respect, in context of flats, the issues above also occur in a variety of building types and occupancies such as schools and hospitals. Now, um, I think you've already told us, but um, do you ever remember receiving this letter or it being brought uh, think, to your attention? I think, with, I think I'm certain that I didn't receive this letter. I think it, in the pack that I got, there is an acknowledgement letter from my private office. So it didn't come to me. And I, in in all of the um, all of the material that was provided to me to study before this appearance today, I found this the most distressing letter because if it arrived earlier, and I had seen it, I think the commissioner, you're you're on the second page now, but I think the commissioner says on the first page I had a close relationship with the borough commander of the London Fire Brigade in Croydon, where I was a constituency MP. Yes. Whatever the official advice had been. If the Commissioner of the London Fire Brigade writes in these terms, listing multiple problems with the system, I would have taken the meeting as a matter of urgency. Mm. I would have assumed that these problems were not unique to London, but if they were being seen across London boroughs, were probably a fundamental problem with the system nationwide. Can you explain how this letter never came to your attention? Uh, because the election had been called, uh, and I was in the constituency and the private office was only referring the most urgent correspondence to me and they obviously decided this was a meeting that could be taken immediately after the election. Right. But... Um, it's the only explanation I can offer you. How can you read this letter and not think that it's raising the most urgent of issues? But it's, it's, it's the only explanation I can offer to you. Well, it's not a satisfactory one. No, it's not. I wish I had seen it. And I wish it had come earlier. Yes. Uh, it's, it's far and away the most, in, in my judgment, it's far and away the most powerful piece yes. of correspondence in the pack because it's referring to multiple issues not just in blocks of flats but in other buildings as well yes and contractor competency yes which we know which hasn't now. been raised elsewhere but you know from the evidence that you've heard it's clearly yes fundamental. we've seen we don't i don't need to take you to it there's an internal lfb email at lfb 00120767 from the 24th of april 2017 saying we've had a reply from the minister's diary manager to say that he's now unavailable to meet during due to the general election 
which was obviously called after we wrote, but that we are welcome to request a meeting after the election. So exactly as you say, there seems to have been a response, but nobody considered this correspondence to be urgent enough to require any form of action before that point. And even if the department, I think probably it's difficult for me, I can't answer for something that I wasn't consulted on. But I suspect what's happened here is that the private office were aware that my seat was a highly marginal seat and were therefore applying quite a high filter of what they sent to me. But even if that were the case, and I, and I would still have wanted this to come to me given the seriousness of it, but even if that was the case, departments had a, have a laws minister. Um, so even if they didn't want to come to me, there was another minister who wasn't responsible that could have met urgently to, if you like, to discuss these issues and then escalate them to myself and the Secretary of State. So I completely agree with you. The fact that this wasn't... It's both distressing to me that it didn't come a bit earlier and I would have seen it and also the way it was then handled. Yes. Um, yes, thank you. Um, can we now look at an email chain at CLG 409421? This is an email... Um, this is an email from Mr Quartermain at the top of the page to Helen McNamara. It's after the Grenfell Tower fire. It's dated the 19th of June 2017 at 10.07pm. And, and just to give you the context here, basically Mr Quartermain is raising some concerns in this email about restructuring uh, that was being proposed, including in relation to his department and what work his department would be taking forward after the Grenfell fire and he's expressing some frustration about decisions that have been taken uh, about that but the part I want to ask you about is at the very end of that first long paragraph um, he says this he says um, it picking up three lines from the end it was only after my appointment as director in charge of the building regulations and energy performance division BREP that I recognise the delay in this area and I can evidence how I got a grip and pushed this forward. I even had a one-to-one -one with Gavin to tell him to pay more attention to the BREP subs. Now, do you see that? I do. Now, um, in relation to this email, at paragraph 40 of his witness statement on page 16, that's CLG 3030866, -30 Mr Quartermain explains that he can't recall the exact date of the meeting, but he says he recalls lingering around at the end of a casework meeting to mention to you that there were building regulation submissions which required your attention, and he says that you told him that you would deal with them. So... That's what we've got from Mr Quartermain. Now, do you recall having this conversation with Mr Quartermain? Yeah, I, I've talked about it during my evidence session already. Uh, so Steve and I would regularly have con conversations where we triaged the, the work that was on my desk, often in relation to the planning case work, but I think I said to you earlier on in the evidence session that there was definitely one conversation. My recollection is that they were about research on, research on either publishing or approving um, research work in relation to the building regulations, where he said to me, this stuff, is urge this stuff has been sitting in your inbox too long and you need to look at it, and that's exactly what I did. Yes. Could that be the push to get something called the usability study out? Possibly. Right. I don't, I don't, I don't recall what the specific conversation was about, but what he is saying here in this uh, email and what he said, I've read his written evidence as well, is entirely accurate. He and I had a very good working relationship and... It was a sort of ongoing dialogue between us to manage the large volume of work and prioritise it. So what yeah. he's saying to you here is entirely fair. And did he put it just like that? Did he say, come on, Gavin, pay more attention to the building regulation submissions? I don't think he used that phrase. I think that phrase is a slightly unfair phrase because that slightly implies that I was reading them but not paying attention to them, which is not true. I think what he said was, you've got a couple of things which the office have been saying to you are not so high priority, but they need dealing with now and you need to give them your attention. That's... That's my memory of how the conversation happened. And following that conversation, did you, did you in fact pay more attention to the building regulations submissions? Well, I've just, I've just explained to you that I think that phrase is an unfair phrase, but I dealt with the submissions that he was uh, referring to in the conversation, yes. And as I said to you, these conversations between us, I suspect it was more than one conversation. 
nearly every week we would have a conversation about the outstanding mixture of subs and casework in his area um, and he would give me very helpful steers about what he wanted me to prioritise at any point in time. And as I said, from my point of view, it was a very um, good relationship where I, where I got clear feedback from him about what he needed. Were you ever made aware of the sense of frustration which members of the Building Regulations Division were experiencing during your time in office, as well as others, due to being a low priority, as Mr Harrell put it, always being at the back of the queue? No, I wasn't, and I wish I had been aware of that. I think there's a fray. I didn't, I didn't, wasn't aware of Mr Harrell's comment, but um, in Mr Quartermain's written evidence, there's a quote where he... I think he's saying he was doing a performance review with Bob Ledsom and he said something like we reflected on what it was like working in an area that wasn't in the sun or some phrase like that he uses. Uh, so I wasn't aware that's how it felt to members of that team uh, and it was distressing to hear that that, that 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 was their experience. That certainly would never have been my intention. I can see why they felt it because clearly there was a period where the Secretary of State and I were prioritising the policy work for the housing white paper. Uh, so I can completely understand during that period why they felt it. I hope they wouldn't have felt it so much during the rest of my time. Right, so you can understand why they felt that frustration during that housing white paper yes, period. Yes, absolutely. And that would have run through October, uh, October 16. October to January. Well, it was, wasn't, wasn't published till February 17, is that yeah, fair? It's the 5th of February, I think. So there's about a four-month period, I would say, during October, November, December, January. Were you ever made aware that the anxiety and frustration within that team was having the effect of making some members of South so stressed to the point of being ill? No, but obviously if I had been made aware of that, I would have wanted to take action to address that. And I think some of the other evidence you've had has been very kind about my work with the department. So it's very distressing to hear that that's how some officials felt. Were you ever uh, consulted about a, a cut in funding to the investigation of Real Fires, Fires contract in order to fill a black hole in the planning budget? Not to my knowledge, no. Richard Harrell said uh, he was very dismayed to learn from Bob Ledsom that there was going to be a, a cut in the funding in relation to that contract to fill a planning budget problem. So in all of the paperwork that's been supplied to me before the before this appearance. I haven't seen any evidence of that. You've clearly got access to a wider set of documents than I've got because you showed me some things today that I haven't seen. Um, so I don't know if you have any document that demonstrates that was a ministerial decision, but I have no recollection of it at all. Were you aware that the Building Regulations Division was working on what was called a, or termed by Mr Harrell, a less than bare bones capacity? No, again, if that was the case, I would have wanted to get some additional resources. I think I say in my one of my two witness statements, I can't remember which, that I was conscious that the resources in the department were stretched. The headcount had reduced over the preceding few years and the Secretary of State and I had talked about that and were looking in the next spending review to try and get some additional resource into the department given that the new Prime Minister had clearly made housing a more high profile political issue. It seemed to us it was only right that that was matched with, with better resourcing for the department. Yes. So I was aware of a problem in the department in generality, but in terms of the specific issue in the team that you've just referred to, no. Right. Mr Chairman, I'm aware of the time. I just have another five minutes' worth of questions that I'd like yes. to be able to put <coughs> to Barwell. Before well, I think we... Lord Barwell will probably keep with another five minutes or so. I'm, I'm happy to stay and answer questions as long as there are questions. No, that's very good. Well, Sorry, Lord... yes, you carry on, Ms Grinch. Yes, Lord Barwell. Yes, thank you. Um, can we agree that in your time as Housing Minister, no positive steps were taken to advance matters of fire safety? I don't think that is a fair thing to say. We clearly had worked on the discussion document uh, and we'd made internal progress. The, the calling of the election stopped that work coming into the public domain. And there were also some changes to the building regulations that I've referred to in my earlier evidence that were in the housing white paper. So I certainly accept that we didn't make the progress that we should have made, but I think the way you phrased it is unfair. Do you consider that you allocated sufficient time to understanding the issues underlying the Lacanel fire and the wider problems underlying approved document B, including on external fire spread? I think some of those issues, it was reasonable of me to wait until the discussion document was out and look at the responses, but I've already acknowledged in under questioning earlier today that I should have taken the time to actually 
see the coroner's letter and the Secretary of State's response to that. So partially accept the point you're making. Yes. I mean, throughout your evidence, we've seen that neither you nor your private office appeared to notice the, the delay that there had been in addressing the coroner's recommendations. Now, I appreciate you say you weren't aware of the specific time frame, but you've accepted, you knew it was in 2013 that the coroner made some recommendations. Um, can we agree that we don't see evidence of you or your private office noticing or holding officials to account for that ongoing delay? So that, that's true, although I think I would say pretty strongly there that had I been given the accurate information about the commitment the Secretary of State had made, that would have resulted in very different decisions. So I think on that issue, I was entitled as Minister to be aware of the timescale that the, sec the then Secretary of State had set for that work. And if I had been aware of that timescale and known that it was really only a matter of months to implement the decision, then my actions would have been very different to what they were. We've also seen that your private office contributed to perhaps some of the delay by failing to prioritise submissions from the building regulations team. Do you accept that? Uh, again, to a degree. Um, we, we talked about this, these appalling delays that occurred to this particular package of um, research. And for the reasons I explained to you, I don't believe that that was my private office that was the cause there. But it's certainly true that some of the submissions took longer to deal with than they should have. When that was raised with me by Steve Quartermain, I addressed it. We've also seen that fire safety matters were raised with you or with your office uh, by the APPG, the British uh, Sprinkler Association, the London Fire Commissioner and the Fire Sector Federation through the letter from Brandon Lewis. And yet, can we agree that those concerns that were raised in those letters were never substantively addressed, nor were their concerns reflected in the discussion document that was produced in March 2017? I mean, we've sort of gone through each of them in turn. Uh, I don't want to repeat the evidence, but I've explained to you why I took the decision not to meet with the Sprinklers Association. With the APPG, I've been very clear that I should have met, uh, with, I should have responded to the original letter and accepted the meeting. The next time I had the opportunity, the next time I saw a letter, I did act to try and get a meeting. Um, and I've the other two letters you referred to were Brandon and to the commissioner. So with the commissioner, I think I was I couldn't have been clearer in my evidence that if I'd seen that letter, um, I would have treated that with the utmost senior seriousness. Whereas to me, the Brandon letter is in a very different class. It, it, it felt and it still feels to me today as a letter from one minister to another saying, here are some issues that our officials are concerned about, we'd like your officials to take into account. So if you, if you take those three pieces of correspondence, I think there is a clear hierarchy in terms of the seriousness of the concerns that they were raising, which I would put the commissioner's letter right at the top mm -hmm. by some clear distance. Okay. Then the APPG and the Sprinklers Association and then Brandon's letter beneath that. Okay. Can we agree that the government's um, housing supply agenda really dominated your time in the department and overshadowed other core work, including to revise approved document B, some of which was life safety critical. So I, I, I absolutely accept that with a couple of important caveats. One is, of course, that the problem, as the department acknowledges in its own opening statement, is that it didn't recognise this work was life safety critical, and therefore I wasn't told that. And secondly, and I just want to put this very gently because... It is absolutely right that the inquiry holds the government to a much higher standard than anybody else because it's the government that ultimately has the responsibility for taking decisions in the public interest. But that context that I mentioned earlier on in terms of the level of scrutiny, the level, the extent to which parliamentarians, select committee, the media, others were raising these issues, um, I think is relevant, uh, relevant context in terms of how this issue was dealt with. It wasn't just the government that was underestimating the degree to which the system was failing. Mm. Okay. Mr Chairman, thank you. I've come to the end of my pre-prepared yes. questions. If we have the usual break. Yes. Um, and then we can sweep up any final points. Yes. Well, Obama, well when Council gets to the end of her questions, we have to have a short break because uh, she needs a, a certain amount of time just to check that nothing's gone adrift. And we have to allow for other people who are following the proceedings to make suggestions for further questions that perhaps we ought to put to you. So we'll stop now. Um, how long do you think you need, Ms Grange? Would quarter to five be long enough? Um, yes, I think so. Well, if, it, if it's not, you can always tell us and we'll 
Yes. Give you a bit more time, but Thank I think you. that ought to do. Um, so we'll break now. We'll we'll come back, please, at quarter to five. And at that point, we'll see if there are any more questions for you. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Would you like to give the usher, please? Thank you. Well, we'll say quarter to five, Miss Grange, but if it turns out that you need more time, Thank you. That's very ask the usher to come and tell us. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much.
Would you ask Lord Barwell to come back in, please? Thank you. Right, Lord Barber. Well, we'll see if there are any more questions for you. Ms. Grange, yes. Yes, just a couple of questions. Um, so we've looked at a number of pieces of correspondence where warnings were raised about fire safety. Just help us with this general question. How should the department ensure that matters of life safety are proper reacted, properly reacted to and not lost in the system? So I, that's a question sort of about the management of the department. I think... The unknowable question here is if the department hadn't made the error that I think it acknowledges it made, which was not to see that the coroner recommendation was about life safety, would it have got lost in the same way? I strongly suspect that it wouldn't, that it would have been prioritised in a completely different way than it was. So the question kind of assumes that there's a fundamental problem with how the department deals with issues of that importance, whereas my sense is, it's really ultimately a judgment for you to reach, is that this issue wasn't flagged as an issue of life safety in terms of the coroner's report, and that's why it, it went missing in the way that it did. Right, and had it been more clearly flagged to you as a, an issue of life safety in the submissions, is it your evidence that you would have responded very differently to, Ab to, to that absolutely, work? Absolutely, but, and I want to, since we're nearing the end of my appearance here, I want to stress this, I don't want to come here today and say, therefore, it's all the fault of officials that they didn't say that to me. Ministers also, not just myself, but a succession of ministers have to take responsibility that maybe there were opportunities where we could have asked questions or done something differently that would have allowed us to identify that that mistake had been made. But absolutely, had I realised that, I would have acted differently. And um, as I said to you earlier, when you were asking me about it, to me, the most distressing thing in the whole pack when I read it was the was the commissioner's letter. Yeah. And help us with this. What would you uh, have done differently, looking back on what we've done, what, what we've gone through today, if you had the chance again? So I think I've tried to touch on some of that as I've been giving evidence to you, but maybe to draw it together, there are three clear things that uh, I believe, and I, and I think your questioning has demonstrated. The first is that I should have had a handover meeting with James as well as Brandon, and I think it would be very good practice for ministers generally to ensure that proper handovers occur, even when ministers are of different political persuasions. There are still important issues that won't be issues of political divide where a handover would be very beneficial. The second uh, issue is in relation to the handling of the APPG correspondence. I think I got it right the second time round. The second time a letter actually arrived on my desk, I intervened, changed the official advice, but I should have done that the first time around. And probably I fear it wouldn't have changed the tragic events that your inquiry is looking at because at that point the refurbishment of Grenfell Tower had already happened and any changes that were made subsequently wouldn't have necessarily impacted that. But it would at least have put the issue clearly on the agenda potentially if the, if the evidence of the APPG had been compelling. And then the third issue would be uh, that I think that I shouldn't have waited until the discussion document was out there to get hold of the coroner's letter and the sec then Secretary of State's response to it. I should have shown more curiosity to see that at the time. And that probably, I think, would have raised in my mind a concern about well, what is it exactly that we've committed to here that I would have wanted to, uh, to bottom out. So those are the three things that, that come to my mind. If that's your last question, may I add just one more yes, of course. point at the end? Mm -hmm. Which is to say, obviously, I'm here today in my capacity as housing minister during the period in which councillors asked me questions. But after doing that job, I was the chief of staff uh, to the prime minister and in that context played a small role in the establishment of this uh, inquiry. And what I've tried to do today, I hope that you all feel that, is to answer the questions to the best of my ability uh, to do everything that I can to help you get to the truth of what happened uh, in the interests both of those who lost people, lost loved ones, suffered trauma themselves and of the future of policy in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Barwell, and, and thank you very much for attending and, and giving us your evidence. It's very much appreciated. My pleasure. And Lord Barwell, it's right that I should add my thanks to you on behalf of all members of the panel. It's always very interesting to us, uh, as well as being very helpful, 
to learn more about how things work on the inside of a department and the relationship between ministers and their private offices and the rest of the department. And, of course, you shed a lot of light on uh, how things developed in the period during which you were uh, the housing minister. So we're very grateful to you for coming along to give us your evidence. Uh, and um, we've learned a lot as a result. So thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. And, of course, you're now free to go. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Grange. Um, that must be it for today, but we have another witness coming tomorrow. Yes, Is that we right? have. Lord Pickles and Mr. Millet will be cross-examining him. Right. Thank you very much. So we break there and we shall resume at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. <laughs>